Um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Cesar Lopez, I'm professor and chair of the Chicago Studies Department here. Welcome everyone, my name is Tikima Mayasa and I'm the chair of the Black Studies Department here at San Diego Mesa College. So we'd like to welcome all of you and ask our panelists to please come forward and sit um, before us. One of the great things about being here at Mesa College is the legacy of the campus community and diversity that we've been able to achieve as we um, celebrate our 50th year anniversary of being a campus. And so part of what we're doing here today is acknowledging that in the spectrum of the larger celebrations of diversity that have been going on across the nation. And with that, this event uh, is really uh, our way of engaging in a dialogue, not just with our campus, but as Takima said, across the community in San Diego region, we have members of uh, different faculty and staff and students uh, from San Diego Community College, from the different regional campuses, um, and, uh, and so it's, 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 great. it's a great opportunity to have this dialogue with, uh, with ourselves and bring in guests uh, that are very well informed in terms of the context of issues of diversity, higher education, at uh, the local level, the regional level, and at the state uh, legislature level. So uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting discussion. We welcome all of you. And so with that, I'd like to bring up uh, our president, Pamela Lester, and our dean of our School of Social Media Science and Multicultural Studies, uh, Charles Zappia. I want to tell you that I'm very excited about the program that's been put together today. Um, I think that we are at a crossroads. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Mesa College and the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. And there's a nexus in that, I think, for us in terms of the programs that Mesa College offers. In the reading that I do on a regular basis, one of the most disturbing questions I hear is what's the value of a degree in ethnic studies, in black studies, or Chicano studies? And out of the other side of our mouths, we ask, What's wrong with our students? Why do we have an achievement gap? Those two statements to me are related. We don't ask what the value is of other degrees. Although I see Denise out there, we probably still ask if there's value in art. Yeah, we probably still do ask that, although I think there's great value in all of this. But when we ask those questions about what the value is of these particular degrees, I believe that that's an attack on the experiences of our black and brown students. That's right. So I'm very happy that we're here today because we have much talking to do with one another about how we support these programs and the value of what the student experience is at Mesa College. And those to me all run together. So I'm happy that you're here today. I'm happy that I'm here today because I'll be listening as well. And I think we have, we have an incredible panel here that will be sharing their experiences and their thoughts on this topic. So welcome to Mesa College, and welcome to what I think is a critical discussion today. Thank you. On behalf of the faculty, the staff, the students uh, of the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences and Multicultural Studies, I want to welcome you and my welcome to uh, the presidents uh, to this event examining the critical contributions of Chicano, Chicano Studies and Black Studies nationally and at San Diego Mesa College. You know, as Dean, I'm mostly concerned with the way our individual programs uh, and disciplines fit in um, and strengthen the school as a unit, uh, how they support our school's mission. But as a scholar and a political progressive, at least by my own estimation, uh, I'm also interested in how disciplines taught in this school fit into the general landscape of academia and what educational and social benefits uh, they offer our students. And last of all, uh, I want to clarify, as the President did, my commitment to Black Studies and Chicano Chicano Studies as valuable academic programs. The School of Social Behavioral Sciences and Multicultural Studies is, is probably the most traditional of all the seven schools uh, at Mesa. Some of our disciplines uh, like philosophy, geography, my own history, uh, can trace their origins back uh, hundreds and hundreds, in fact, uh, several thousand years uh, as formal academic disciplines in the, in the uh, Western world. Uh, black studies and Chicano Chicano studies are definitely of much more recent origin. Most date the founding of the latter, Chicano studies, to the spring of 1969 with the drafting of El Plan de Santa Barbara. At the height of the civil rights uh, struggle of that era, the drafters of that document recognized that effective movements for social justice must be informed 
by careful study and critical analysis of the origins and characteristics of existing power structures. Not coincidentally, uh, we can also date the founding of black studies to 1969, when a long, bitter student and faculty strike at what was then San Francisco State College uh, led to the establishment of the first Department of Black Studies, in, presently Africana Studies at San Francisco State. One of the major goals of those who pushed for a Black Studies program was to counter the institutional racism that dominated many colleges and universities, but to do so by offering a rigorous intellectual curriculum rooted in the black cultural, political, and historical experience. My point is that from the earliest days, Chicano studies, black studies, were not merely expressions of ethnic nationalism. Both were solid academic programs enriched with a deep sense of mission. Uh, ever since the late 1960s, the most successful black studies and Chicano, Chicano studies programs have offered cross-disciplinary studies of the historical experiences, values, cultural representations, and social economic issues of their communities, locally, regionally, and nationally. Like other traditional academic disciplines, the primary focus of the strongest programs is on teaching based on careful scholarship. Strong such programs demand critical thinking, they polish communication skills, they include global perspectives, encourage civic responsibility and self-awareness. They are built on an expectation that good scholarship can inform public policy. In the pursuit of fulfilling that expectation, black studies and Chicano Chicano studies departments are generally oriented toward broader community involvement and have not been bashful about declaring their dedication to the pursuit of social justice. Let me be clear, I don't find advocacy efforts and community involvement to be in any way contradictory to the best traditions of the academy. The mission of our school has long been to offer our students the highest quality education intended to help them not only make a living, but to help them make better lives for themselves, for their communities, for our world. The best courses in black studies and Chicano studies offer the broad critical analysis essential to learning. They examine that hard intersection of race, class, ethnicity, and gender, as do many of the other courses in our school. In fact, I would argue that studying and analyzing that intersection is the sine qua non for understanding the distribution of wealth and power in the modern world. And such study and analysis are sound academically and they are beneficial socially. We need to better understand our society so that we can best, at least try to make, <laughs> this world a better place for all. That's a mission I've always supported and will continue to do so. I look forward to hearing the insights of today's panelists, and I thank you very deeply for giving me the opportunity to participate in today's program. I want to, uh, both uh, Takim and I are, are going to talk a little bit about the departments, and we won't take long. Um, so a brief history of the department. Our department was founded or established in the fall of 1970. Uh, in the beginning, right, in the beginning, <laughs> well, there's many beginnings, right, um, and in the context of the beginnings for our department, like all Chicano Studies Department, there was an interconnection with students, with the community, with faculty and staff, uh, trying to expand the scope and the mission of the college and university. Gracia Molina de Pic was a professor here in the Spanish department, languages department, uh, starting in 1966, and through her work, uh, working with the students, working with community and her advocacy, uh, helped to found the Chicano Studies Department. Uh, she was also a key part of El Plan de Santa Barbara in 1969. She helped to write El Plan. She was part of the platicas and the talks and, and the, the coming together uh, of this document, which was, for that, those that are not familiar, uh, a master plan for how to really institutionalize Chicano Studies uh, in the colleges and universities. Uh, and Mesa College has a special place in El Plan, actually, along with Gracia's participation in the appendix, the AA, along with other curriculum and, and, uh, and guidelines and things in the plan, is the San Diego Mesa College AA. So uh, Chicano Studies, uh, you know, Mesa, Mesa College is a part of that founding as well. Um, just a couple pictures on some of our, our professors. Cesar, professor Cesar Gonzalez Emeritus, uh, he was a founding chair uh, and professor of the department in 1970. Uh, Professor Mike Ornelas, who who's, uh, came uh, to Mesa College in 76. 
Uh, still with us today, uh, Rita Sanchez, uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, came in 1990, uh, myself in 2004, and Professor Velez uh, in 2007. Uh, here are just a couple pictures of some other faculty and uh, from other departments and counselors that are also part of what makes Chicano Studies uh, and supporting Black Studies work uh, here at Mesa College. Professor Alessandra Montezuma uh, teaches in the art department. She's an art department faculty, but she regularly teaches our Chicano art class. Uh, there's Counselor Cynthia Rico Bravo, or Cynthia Rico with her daughter, Guillermo uh, Burujo, and uh, Cynthia, uh, Lupe Gonzalez, counselors, right, working with students. This is a great picture off our website of uh, Guillermo congratulating students getting scholarships, the annual scholarships that we give. And there's a picture of us at graduation. Uh, a little bit on student and, and diversity. Uh, just to give you some numbers this morning. Uh, Mesa College uh, enrollment by ethnicity, and this is from, this, uh, from spring 2014, right, the first census. Uh, 24,000 students, over 24,000 students, and here's the breakdown. Um, you know, for uh, African American, 7%, American Indian, it's actually 0.3%, no, 0.3%, Asian, 12%, uh, Pacific Islander, 4%, um, Filipino, I'm Filipino, uh, sorry, Filipino, 4%, Pacific Islander, 1%, Chicano Latino, 32%, and White, 34%. And one thing that really stands out in terms of these numbers is that over the last five years, right, uh, we've seen a rise of over 60% in Chicano Latino students here at Mesa College. So really, we're in a, a huge period of transition in terms of the student population. Uh, Mesa College, traditionally, uh, majority white student population is, is, is shifted, and shifted along the lines of Latinos in particular, and Asians uh, as well. A little bit on numbers for our classes. On average, we have uh, about 884 uh, students enrolled in the fall semesters, and this is over an average over uh, five years, and then 917 average uh, in the spring. Uh, retention rates for fall and spring semesters over the average over those years, about 86%. Uh, we have an active uh, metro group, right, that was part of the, the founding of the department as well, and still is active today. We have machistas here. Uh, any machistas, raise your hand. Four even former machistas, right? Right, right? Yes, 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 yes. Right. Uh, a little bit about uh, collaborations across community, because like this is the kind of event that we continually have, that we've had in, in different instances in different places. Uh, collaborations across communities uh, help us better understand you know, the situations and the realities of, of how to better serve students and the mission of the colleges and universities. Uh, here's a picture uh, of faculty from uh, some of you may be in the room, from City, from Southwestern, from Grossmont. Uh, Enrique Davalos is here, chair of uh, Chicano Studies uh, at City College, right? Uh, Norma is here, and Mr. Fredfield is here from uh, San Diego State, and other uh, faculty uh, in the room as well. <laughs> and so we have a tradition of working in collaboration, especially here at Mesa College between Chicano Studies and Black Studies. So this is a, our meet and greet event that we do annually uh, that started a couple of years ago and we continue to do it uh, in terms of giving students, uh, informing them about our classes, about our programs, but also about resources on campus and how they can better succeed. Uh, in 2010, we hosted Black Studies and Chicano Studies hosted the uh, San Diego Ethnic Studies Consortium Conference that brought together uh, unprecedented, I think it's an unprecedented number of, of uh, ethnic studies uh, related program, faculty, staff, students, and, and community support to the campus uh, around issues of uh, diversity, eth equity, uh, and ethnic studies. Uh, this is 2010. Uh, so then looking ahead, so just I'll end with this, just to give a little context here, right? So we're talking about the, the, the legacies of the department. Uh, the picture you see here, you have the uh, old bungalow, right, which uh, used to house Black Studies and Chicano Studies. So I found this picture, right, and it says really clear, right? So from the 70s until about 2000, that's where Chicano Studies and Black Studies was housed. So there was, you know, this kind of institutional memory that's, you know, that space is no longer there, there's going to be a new building in that area. And, um, and then we moved into the Humanities, Languages, Multicultural Studies building in, 20, in uh, 2002, right? Um, we are a Hispanic serving institution uh, uh, as of 2012, and also uh, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution as of 2013. Um, Cesar, uh, Professor Cesar Gonzalez is emeritus, but uh, he has an annual Betty uh, and Cesar Gonzalez student scholarship that we give out. Uh, Professor Gracia Molina has come back to Mesa College. Uh, we're having an event for her next week, which I'll show in the next slide. But she generously and her family gave us uh, a gift, an endowment gift of $80,000. Um, and that's for the Chicano Studies Department. She wanted to clearly, this is an endowment for Chicano Studies. You know, and and, uh, and you know, as, as our founder and as uh, someone who's 
you know, had a long career of activism and, and dedication to community, it's been uh, remarkable to have her uh, come back to Mesa College. Uh, so here's the, the flyer for the event, and if I, I invite everyone here, maybe you've already seen my emails and stuff, I send a lot out. Uh, this is next week, it's going to be on Thursday at 11 a.m., and it'll be on the other side of the G building, which is the building right out here. And here's what we're going to be doing, we're going to be dedicating and unveiling the Gracia Molina de Pig Glass Gallery. So it should be wonderful. We're also going to have a, a lecture by two of her former students, Carlos and Linda Legrete, who were her students here at Mesa College in um, 1967 through 1969. And I recently found uh, old uh, Olympian um, newspaper clippings from those times that, that share a little bit more about the history of, uh, of Chicano studies. But there's a brief summary, um, and um, now we're back to our panel. So back to Takima. Okay, so in the spirit of keeping this brief, Malcolm X said, make it plain, keep it simple. And so one of the things I'd like to say about the Black Studies Department <coughs> at San Diego Mesa College is one that I'm happy to be the chair of it and the legacy that we've had as a community in service to the community. And we are here like every ethnic studies program because of the community's efforts to take and have itself represented. San Diego Mesa College is no different. In the fall of 1971 is when we offered our first classes. Many of the classes for a while were housed continuously with, um, in conjunction with the uh, San Diego High School District. And then over the time period under the leadership of Katie Anderson, we became a full-fledged department. And for 20 years, from 1971 to 1993, until Starla Lewis became our chair, we had an astounding growth effort with students who found who they were. It was a cultivating period in time where the holistic development of students was very, very important, where they could see themselves not only in the academics, but as they learned the academics about themselves, how that related to the community. To fast forward that under the leadership of Starla Lewis, we had transformative education, and that transformative ed education was about life mastery. How do you take and effectively fuse the academics and life experiences such that students not only can get jobs, but that their experiences are empowering to the world? And that's very important because our staff here at San Diego Mesa College have been change agents in numerous ways. We've exposed our students to some of the world's greatest scholars. They've been able to meet Michael Dyson, Cornell West, They've been able to take and um, uh, talk with scholars like um, Toni Morrison through her interactions with Teresa Ford. There's been so many things. We've taken our students to conferences like the National Council for Black Studies where they, in their scholarship, have taken as the only community college students to be there and to present amongst not only undergraduate students but graduate students at this professional conference and to get accolades for their performances. So we have done a tremendous job in taking and helping students, not just African American students. There's a, there's a perspective that black studies is only for black people or that Chicano studies is only for Chicano people. And the reality is that these studies as a foundation really represent a more humanistic approach to learning. And in that humanistic approach to learning, we see ourselves in one another. And because of that, if we want to talk about statistics, you know, um, black studies has had consistently about seven, at our highest point, eight percent student population. But we are one of the most diverse uh, departments on campus. You can come into a black studies class and see every ethnic group there is, from international students to students who are um, from the border, from students who are born and bred right here in America. And the experiences that they have with one another, one another have been life-changing. And because of those life-changing experiences, we have students that have gone on and who are making strides in no other kind of way, than, more than you can imagine. On top of that, I want to just mention this when we talk about policy change. Our faculty, and I, if you are a faculty member here at in Black Studies, please rise because I want to acknowledge you. I know that Denise Rogers is here. Uh, I'd like to ask Judy Sandayo to stand, please, as a counselor for our students who has 
come and make sure they have a meeting. Often we are here as teachers, also at Mesa at uh, City College and at San Diego State. We have a faculty. Thank you so very much. We have faculty and support. Um, also, Ashanti Hans, could you stand for a moment as well, please? Um, we have support for Black Studies and Chicano Studies as part of this campus community that I'm going to say is not necessarily traditional on all, on, all, on all campuses. And because of that support, our students not only do well, but they excel. And they have excellence in their perspective of who they are and what they can do in the world. And as a result of that, they come back and they share their life stories and how what they've learned in our classes has helped them to transcend and do well at San Diego State and other things. We had the very good fortunate um, fortune of taking and establishing, I believe it was in 2005, Dr. Weber, a, uh, an MOU with San Diego State for our students to, um, in Black Studies who are, would be transferring as Africana Studies to participate in their study abroad. And we've had two students who were Mesa College students who transferred to San Diego State who um, did study abroad, went to Ghana and um, South Africa and the various places. And that relationship is um, something that I treasure very dearly as a person who's an alumni of San Diego State and the Africana Studies Department from there. So we have been blessed and with the legacy of excellence and the journey of excellence that we provide for our students. And if you're a student of black studies, stand up. So you can be recognized for what you do. So with that, so with that, Shaiko Kwayana, who is not here today, did some groundbreaking policy change. Uh, among the National Education Association, which was in Atlanta this past summer, among delegates of 15,000 people, she was able, as we talk about having core curriculum alignment, was able to take and have the delegates support a policy change to have the antiquity of Africa included as a necessary component of compulsory education. And many people told her that that, 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 that it, that it wouldn't be done, that she couldn't do it. The reality is, not only did they embrace it, but they embraced it overwhelmingly, understanding that diversity does matter. And that's why we're here, to say that diversity not only matters, but it's imperative as we move into a global, we are in a global economy, a global society. With that being said, I'm going to close out by saying I'm grateful that all of you are here. I know Cesar and I, and Juliet Parker, who is our articulations officer, is someone who keeps us on task as an institution to ensure that we are meeting the goals and the um, standards that we set as an institution to ensure that we are diversified across curriculum and other types of things. So I want to acknowledge her as well because she was very instrumental in, in bringing this forward. This so that being said, okay, uh, we would like to take and have our panelists introduce themselves because, you know, they, they have a, a laundry list, as you can imagine, of just accolades and uh, achievements. But we would like for you to introduce yourselves and then after the introductions, we'll go ahead and start with our uh, program presentation. I'm uh, Dr. Shirley Weber. I'm the Assemblywoman from the 79th Assembly District representing the city of San Diego, um, La Mesa, National City, Lemon Grove, uh, Bonita, and Otay, part of uh, Chula Vista. Um, I am, and I'm going to make it very brief, I spent 41 years as a professor and chair of the Department of Africana Studies at San Diego State U University, one of the founding members of the department, recently retired and moved to the State Assembly. I serve on the Education Committee of the Assembly, the Higher Ed Committee, the Appropriations Committee, Banking and Finance. I'm currently the chair of the budget that deals with all health and human service issues and also recently appointed the chair of the Campus Climate Committee, Special Commission, 
and the Commission on Higher Ed in San Diego. So look forward to having a conversation with you. My name is Starla Lewis. Uh, I was department chair at Mesa College for 11 long years. <laughs> and I was a faculty member here for 20 years. Uh, I have gone on to repurpose my life. My focus is on women and women's issues because I believe that it is women who are going to transform the world. Good morning, everybody. My name is Val Cuevas. I'm the Director of External Relations with the Education Trust West. We are a policy, research, and advocacy organization based in Oakland, California, or a statewide organization. And we work on identifying what are some of the opportunity and achievement gaps that disproportionately impact students of color, low-income students, foster youth, immigrant students, and then what are the strategies that we can use to forever close those gaps. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Beatriz Tapia. I am an associate professor of Chicana, Chicano Studies at um, East Los Angeles College. Um, and what else? Um, it's really great to be here to talk a little bit about kind of our program um, and some of the things that we're doing, particularly in this climate where it seems like, like there's a lot of issues that our programs, I think, are uniquely um, designed to address and, and, and to call attention to the fact that a lot of the, what we do is, in fact, attempting to, and has been for decades now, trying to address some of the issues um, of Latino, um, African American, um, students of color in general, and, and um, immigrant students. So I'm really glad to be here, and it'll be um, nice to be able to dialogue with colleagues. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alejandro Gadilla. I am the chair of Chicano and Chicano Studies and African American Studies at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, I am a native of San Diego, an alum of uh, Hoover High School, uh, and yeah, I got my peeps in the back. A shout out to my family. My brother's here. Uh, the Gonzalez family's here. Gloria's here. His wife's here. Uh, these are people who I've known since you know, childhood, elementary school, Edison Elementary. Uh, Wilson Junior High School and Hoover High School. You got to call it out. You got to call your roots out. Uh, and I think that's one of the great things about this presentation today is that uh, it's a coming home, and I get to speak to issues that uh, are very important to me. Uh, and in particular, coming back here and supporting a great colleague like Cesar Lopez, uh, all the work that he's done. And one of the things you need to know about ethnic studies faculty is that we're always working, and we're always caring for our students. And our chairs are always pulling our hair out in terms of making sure everything gets right and gets done correctly. So uh, thank you, everybody, for this event. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you, Dr. Claudia, to take and start our conversation. Um, as the chair of Black Studies and Chicano Studies, can you elaborate what some of those experiences have been on your, at your campus? Um, and, uh, and, and as such, where you see the state of the disciplines and um, and where do you think we need to go and, and maybe some of the concerns you might have as well as some of the progresses that you have seen being in that position. All right, well, welcome and again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm in the unique position of representing two departments uh, that are kind of in the spotlight right now across the country. Um, I definitely welcome the opportunity to uh, chair two departments. I'm the only person, I think, in the Cal State system who is chairing two departments simultaneously. Um, and I'll get a little bit into that in terms of why I stepped up to do that. It goes back to political passion as well as personal commitment. I dedicate this talk today to students who sit silently or sit silenced in their seats. May you find voice and community to speak the truth in class. I also dedicate this talk today to my father uh, who worked for the County of San Diego and actually worked down the street uh, at the County Operational Building just down the street. So I do find it very pleasing, and, and my dad's actually watching my, my daughter tonight, so uh, today, so he couldn't be here, but uh, very uh, powerful for me to be here because he also used the community college system for vocational training. He used the, the opportunities here to give his children opportunity, and all three of us now have college education, so that is something that I want to give thanks to, uh, as well as to my brother uh, who works at San Diego City College, your sister campus. Uh, he's gone through the colleges here in the system and had something also to acknowledge as well. And uh, to all my friends and family from the area too, so I know that my 
childhood friend Javier, his daughter is here in the school, so it just it's very important to, today. All right, um, just some quick issues in terms of demographics. One of the things I always tell my friends in policy, demographics will not create institutional changes alone, right? You have the example of South Africa, right? It was 95% black, 5% uh, white, and yet we saw how the dynamics work. So demographics alone is not enough for us to have change. We have to be the leaders of those change. So here we are in 2010, and 15% of the total population in the United States is of Latino background. When we look at the educational issues here, we see that um, when we look at the Hispanic population in particular, we see the uh, lack of higher ed educational attainment. And this is something in terms of looking at demographics is not sustainable. We cannot have one of the largest growing populations uh, continue to grow without having college education. Um, and basically, another comparative model to the gold perspective, this is what Palestine becomes when you lock people out of opportunity. When we look at uh, the different pipelines, uh, what we'll see here is that uh, the uh, first half of the numbers, uh, let's see, the first number is uh, women and the second half is men. When we look at the educational pipeline, and the 100 represents those children who enter kindergarten. So that by the time we get to high school graduation, and by the time we get to college, we see the great drop off of students of color through the educational pipeline. And when we think of graduate education, right, and we're now down to, from the 100 kids in kindergarten, we're now down for Af um, African Americans and Latinos and Native Americans and other groups. But let's talk about African Americans and Latinos. Uh, we're down to five and four. So that pipeline hemorrhages, right? We're pushed out at key parts of the pipeline. Um, and then when we think about people such as myself, Point four, that's not even a whole person, that's a point four, right? So we have to think about that in terms of these critical policy issues. Uh, this is one looking specifically at Latinos, and this one actually pulls into community college. We can start to see the numbers of people who start in elementary school, the 50% dropout rate, uh, the numbers who enroll in college. With most of our kids, we know, uh, according to UCLA's higher ed research center, most of the students of color will enter the community colleges. And in fact, most Latino leaders, whether they are attorneys, faculty, medical professionals, go through the community college first. So the community college is critical for student of color success. Uh, but we see, numerically though, out of that 19 that come to community college, only one will transfer. Right? So if this is our opportunity structure, this is a problem. Right? Uh, 10 will get the degree, 4 will get a graduate degree, and then PhD again, that point four. These are the income, right? We see people with high school degrees, uh, some college associates, right? Here's an th associate's degree, the AA degrees. Um, and then we see how the pay scale progresses in terms of higher ed education. So that's why I, I, I'm so critical and passionate about it, because this really impacts people's lives and opportunities. Um, what are we doing at Cal State Fullerton? Um, we are actually doing a climate survey. And we are finally, for the first time, looking at the climate of faculty of color, staff of color, and the students of color at Cal State Fullerton. Cal State Fullerton uh, is and continues to be in the heart of conservative right-wing Orange County. Right? But there is a transformation going on because Orange County demographically is changing. And this is something critical, and we have great leadership. Dr. Mildred Garcia has instituted multitudes of change. Um, we have a strategic plan. I don't have time to go through it here. Uh, Cal State Fullerton, just go strategic plan. And you can see the way in which diversity initiatives are embedded in our master plan for the next five years. Everything from student enrollment to retaining and recruiting faculty of color, it's all embedded in this plan that is going to direct our money and our hiring for the next five years. Okay, why ethnic studies? Why is it unique? We had these questions earlier. How's it different from other majors? What kind of job skills will you acquire as an ethnic studies major? Right, one of the things that we have is ethnic studies thinking. And one of the things that I say about ethnic studies thinking is that actually, though the discipline has only been around since the late 1960s, our thinking has been around since 1492. Let's be very clear with that in terms of the intellectual thought and how people survive colonialism and the interaction with the West. We have been thinking this way since 1492 because this is how we survived. Right? So it requires that we engage in intellectual disobedience. Yeah. Right? 
So that we are changing the terms of the conversation implies changing uh, uh, the conversation implies intellectual disobedience. It is necessary to focus on the knower rather than on the known. Uh, what does intellectual disobedience look like? It looks like this. When you think differently, right? Many students like to put on their resumes, I think outside the box. Well, what people don't realize what that means is when you think outside the box and you sit outside the box, you will have hot coffee poured on you. People will spit on you. So there is a challenge in terms of when you think differently, right? And this is what intellectual disobedience looks like, sitting in that space and taking that space and making a change in difference. Ethnic studies thought comes from scholars of color, feminists of color, queer scholars of color, and Marxists of color. Yes, in San Diego, I said Marxists of color. Um, it's just a fact. All right. Uh, Audre Lorde demonstrates this type of thinking. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. This may allow us to temporarily beat him in his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. So what does this mean? We need to do as we've continually done, invent our own tools, build our own house, self-reliance and sovereignty, especially sovereignty of thought. We need to encourage our students to think differently. Barbara Christian, a uh, black feminist uh, literary scholar, mentions this issue in terms of why we are different intellectually. My major objection to the race for theory, as some readers have probably guessed by now, really hinges on the question, for whom are we doing what we are doing when we do literary criticism or research? For whom? And many of us do it for our, our, for our community. Right? We do it because we have seen on the ground what needs to be changed. Now, my area, I'm a medical anthropologist and bioethicist, and I bring ethnic studies thinking into my research. Now, here's an example of ethnic studies thinking. In the news, in Oakland, we recently had the Jahi McMath case. Uh, it was a case where she went in for a tonsillectomy, a, a young teenage girl, and uh, through the procedure, she ends up dying. The dominant lens and the dominant perspective by the media the medical profession, and the entire bioethics community focused on the fact that the black community and this family does not understand legal brain death and what that means. The ethnic <clears throat> studies question, the ethnic studies perspective says that's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is who killed that child? Yes. Who will be accountable to that family? Who are the doctors, and how will those doctors and hospitals be punished? That's the ethnic studies perspective, right? Not, we don't understand brain death. There's a reason why, historically, when you study the history of African Americans, you begin to see the legacy of why African Americans, because of the history of medicine with slavery, the history of medicine with the Tuskegee experiment, why people do not trust medicine, and why African Americans do not trust the hospital to disconnect their child from life support. Those are the questions we need to ask, not whether or not people understand legal brain death. Right. Bell Hooks reminds us, all of our silences in the face of racist assaults are acts of complicity. So we have to learn to speak and talk. Right. All right. Uh, the Cal State Fullerton scenario, uh, we had to quickly rebuild the department. Both Chicano studies and African American studies were allowed to collapse. Uh, part of my experience at Cal State Fullerton as an untenured professor was I had to immediately begin to rebuild the department. And I had to become chair as an untenured faculty person, which is a big no-no usually, but I decided to do it. So we began to uh, really look at what was going on, and one of the problems with the prior administration and faculty was they talked about supporting diversity, but never backed it up with action. So we can talk all we want about students of color and we support diversity, but if there is no action plan, and more importantly, if there's no money, then words are meaningless. Uh, where to begin? Administrative support. We needed new tenure hires. We needed a, a reassessment of needs. Equity and funding with other comparable departments. Hiring full-time and part-time instructors. Uh, hiring quality instructors. All of our faculty in African American Studies and Chicano Studies come from top-tier institutions. Creating higher standards and expectations for faculty, hiring culturally aware and culturally competent faculty. If you do not know how to work with students of color, especially in this day and age, you need to learn. There's a way you work with our communities. 
require a culture of respect for students, improve quality of the adjunct pool. Oh, these are different issues. All right. Curricular changes, update and modernize the curriculum, embed key disciplinary skills into the curriculum, critical thinking, writing and reading, civic engagement, cultural linguistic competency, problem solving, data and empirical based knowledge, student success and high impact, impact practices, and blending, this is what a, a, my colleague here, Daniel Mesa, was saying, blend home knowledge with university knowledge. We are not about stripping people of their experiences, right? right? We've been doing that since 1492. So we're doing something a little different. <coughs> Academic rigor plus faculty engagement with students. Faculty <coughs> engagement, if you are hiring faculty and they are not engaged with their students, they are not doing their job, period. <laughs> So that we begin to uh, look at what you can do in terms of uh, increasing the quality of education for the students. Uh, Book-based learning, not textbooks, no scan trots, essay tests, get them writing. Our children need to be writing more. <clears throat> right? Encourage group assignments, encourage technology. So student engagement, creating student associations, giving students a physical space where they can be and gather. Uh, develop a culture of research and professionalism. Uh, a financial development plan, we are raising money, similar to what Cesar is doing here, an emergent scholars program, academic performance, and time to degree. We have to worry about graduation, right? We can build their minds and everything, but their moms and dads want to see them with a little piece of paper in their hand at the end of the day. So that's part of our job as well. Uh, community engagement, and we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, Cal State Fullerton, we work in, in a large configuration with Santa Ana College, uh, Fullerton College, Cypress College, UC Irvine, the private schools, and the high school districts of Orange County. And we have a massive partnership, and I can talk about that during our uh, talking period. All right. So uh, that's the end of my talk. I will be available for questions on the panel. But again, thank you. OK. Um. Good morning again. Um, yes, I am here I'm representing the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies at um, East Los Angeles College. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about our program, um, our department, a little bit of the history, also a little bit of information about our college. Um, and then um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're currently working on. Um, and, and hopefully we can get through if I can do it. Okay, um, so really quick, East Los Angeles College is part of a nine district, um, a nine campus district, um, the Los Angeles Community College District. We, our, our college opened in 1945 at Garfield High School in East LA, um, but in, within three years they moved to their present location. We're actually in the city of Monterey Park, which is a small suburban, um, uh, mostly Asian American um, city. Um, and that's where we've been and that's where we continue to grow. Um, what's, what's interesting about our college is that we actually service a wide area. It encompasses about 100 square miles um, in LA County. That's just our college, or one of the nine. Um, and we service um, parts or, um, or most or parts of several cities, including Alhambra, Belleville Gardens. Um, it includes many school districts. Um, and so we're unique in that we do serve a wide variety of cities, um, differing um, incomes and, and, and demographics. Um, just real quick, I didn't put a slide up here about it. Um, the largest group at, on our college, the two largest groups are Asian American and, and Latino. Um, African Americans represent about 2% of our college, um, which is very small. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what's going on with um, African American and Asian American studies on our campus. Um, so that's just a little bit about us. Okay, Chicano Studies at East LA College. Um, we actually began as Mexican American Studies, and it was really as a result of the high school walkouts that were taking place in East Los Angeles at that time. And our program um, emerged as Mexican American Studies. Um, our first chair was Chris Ruiz, and it emerged as a department um, in 1968. Okay, um, initially they began with very small numbers of classes, and the way they created the program is, was they took some existing courses from different um, uh, departments and began to tailor them. Courses that maybe addressed um, students of color or people of color, and they began to tailor those. Um, during this time, 
um, there was a lot of community activism taking place in East Los Angeles. And I have to say that the college, together with their student group, Mexican American Student Association, um, a student journal called La Nueva Vida, which was really um, a, a newspaper that was very involved in, in promoting a lot of the activism that was taking place, um, those three groups really work together um, to get involved in, in bringing educational um, excellence to students um, in the community and on campus. In the 1970s, the department changed its name after the Plan de Santa Barbara and, and many programs began establishing themselves as Chicano Studies. Our department changed its name. Um, it continued to grow. Currently, we have seven full-time faculty in Chicano Chicano Studies. Um, tenured or tenure track. In fact, everyone's tenured except our newest faculty person. She's on the tenure track. Um, and uh, we have 15 adjunct. Um, it's, our adjunct pool has actually shrunk. The budget crisis of 2008-2009 really um, had a, an impact on us. Um, our curriculum is one of the largest and most um, diverse, probably, community college Chicano studies um, a curricula that, that are out there. We offer over 25 distinct courses. Um, and I'll just move through this quickly. Um, I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. But our courses span um, uh, social sciences, history, um, humanities. We have art classes, um, folklore classes. Most of our courses focus on Mexican American and Latino um, uh, experiences. We are currently adding, we just got approved at, the, um, at our curriculum committee, um, three new courses in Central American um, studies classes, Central Americans in the U.S. Um, and this is a direct response to our changing demographics. Um, increasingly, we get students who do take Chicano studies classes who might not be of Mexican origin, but feel like these classes in some way speak to them. And I think it has to do with what, what Dr. Gavilla talked about, which is it's not just providing content, oh, they learn about themselves, it's a perspective. And I think that's what we really take seriously in our department, in Chicano studies. That it's not just about, you know, coloring history brown with a brown crayon, right? That it's really about that perspective that challenges students to, to see themselves and to think about themselves and then what they're going to do with it, right? You talked about at the service of our community. And I think that that's really at the heart of it. A lot of times people uh, mistake what we do for, well, you know, it's feel-good studies or it's just about making students. It's about empowerment, most definitely. But I think that it really is about utilizing those components. It's intellectual development, it's, it's engagement in the community, and we really strive through all our classes to be able to, um, to engage our students in that kind of an education. Um, let me quickly, I'm trying to move fast here. Um, we do offer an associate's degree in our program, um, and we don't have a lot of majors. But part of what happens is that um, a lot of our students take our classes. Um, a large percentage of students who come through our classes won't major because many of them are really on the transfer um, a, a, a map. And so they don't need the AA. We've encouraged students who have maybe taken almost all of the classes they need for the AA to maybe stick around or come back and you know, finish the degree. But really our focus has been on transfer. Um, our courses, every single one of our courses, those 25 some odd courses, they all articulate. They're all either IGETSI or um, CSU, um, CSU um, articulated. So what that means is that students, for example, can take their, um, their IGETSI history or their institution's requirements and take them through us. And students do that. We find that so many of our students who need a humanities requirement will take a Chicano literature class. Um, and a lot of what we do is that even though we do service a largely uh, Latino population, we, we also, our, our campus is also largely Asian American, and we have a lot of Asian American students who take our classes increasingly. We also have African American students who take our classes. And what we find is that the success rates for those students, um, students of color, um, for African Americans and Latinos, the success rates in our courses are almost exactly the same. Um, and so, so they do well, and I think that it is because we're engaged in a discussion that even though it's Chicano Studies, most of us who are in those programs are trained um, in ethnic studies, um, interdisciplinary and comparative ethnic studies, so we really try to make those links. 
I think students realize that, you know, if they're living in Southern California and they're going to be working as professionals with, with whomever, whatever community, um, increasingly we need to learn about each other. Um, we do have an African American Studies program on our campus. Um, it is housed within the, the Social Sciences Department. And so one of the things that I think that, that we find, and, and that certainly Chicano Studies on our campus is an example of, is that when we are independent departments, um, there is a commitment to make sure that they grow and they thrive. I think part of what's been difficult for both Asian American Studies and African American Studies on our campus is that they are housed in a different department. So when we talk about resources, when we talk about uh, human resources, faculty, um, they're really having to kind of fight it out with everything else that's housed under social sciences in that department, sociology, um, political science. And I think that, it, in my opinion, um, it's one of the things that's hindering the growth. Um, African American Studies is currently looking to maybe change um, the, their name and perhaps increase their focus. They're, they're toying with the idea of switching to uh, Pan-African Studies um, because that way they'll be able to offer classes and, and work with faculty they have who have specialties in areas maybe not in African American but perhaps who study um, uh, uh, Africa or, or the diaspora communities. So that's something that they're undergoing and I think that um, for me it just it really solidifies the, the, that we're fortunate that from the get-go we fought to establish departments and I think that's the wonderful thing about um, San Diego Mesa is that you have those departments that stand as departments and not subsumed under you know these units because that's really what allows us to be successful. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our course offerings and just so you get an idea. Um, we offer classes on our main campus in Monterey Park, and it's about 10 miles east of, of downtown LA. Um, but we also have a second um, satellite campus in the city of Southgate, which is um, southeast of downtown LA. And one of the things that we found is that our Chicano Studies classes um, are very popular. And during the budget crisis, it was very difficult because it was hard for us to offer classes at our satellite um, as well as um, on our campus because they allot us certain classes and then we have to figure out how we divvy them up. And so one of the things that um, is true is that after the passage of Prop 30, we've started to grow again in terms of how many sections we offer. Um, last semester in the fall, we offered 51 sections of Chicano Studies classes. They fill. We turn students away. And that is something that people um, often don't understand. And it, again, it's not just Chicano Studies. People want to take their US history from a Chicano Studies perspective. People want to learn about the folklore. People want to take classes in art. And one of the things that we find is that you know every class is full. We're capped at 45. Um, most of us will carry an average of about 45 to 50 students per class per semester. And so the idea that somehow there's no interest, you know, in, in Chicano studies there's been some discussion about, well, do students identify as Chicano and don't they? And I have to say, you know what, whether they do or not, they're coming into our doors. And even though that's usually the first thing most of us in Chicano studies cover, what is a Chicano, right? For students, in the end, it doesn't really matter because there's something about the course content, the perspective, that they really are engaged in. And I have students who are non-Chicano, even non-Latino, who say, I, I really i am down with, with, with the politics and I'm down with the perspective, so I'm Chicana too. And I'm like, right on. Because I think, it, again, it comes back to perspective. So these discussions, well, these are the, they're immigrant children. They don't they really do identify with what we're doing. And that, I think, is the bottom line. Part of it has to do with we care. When they walk in our doors, faculty care. They confide in us, all kinds of things that we wish they probably wouldn't, but they do. <laughs> There's that connection, and I think we're that connection between their communities and, 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 and the institution. And so 51 sections last semester. This semester, we're offering 53. Um, we're not yet at where we were in 2006, 2007. So that says something. Um, one of the things that I will say is that we currently, um, we just got a new president, 
Marvin Martinez, um, who's been absolutely wonderful for us. Because he too, like Mildred Garcia at um, Cal State Fullerton, really had, is talking about diversity, not just in terms of our students. The demographic shifts make it so that our student body is very diverse, if you will, right? But in terms of faculty, in terms of staff, and one of the reasons why they're trying to embed this diversity is because we do have that achievement gap. Even in Chicano studies, we find that our students don't fare as well as some others. There's something there. There's something wrong. And so our new president is really working with um, strengthening our ties to the community. We've always been community focused. I think for a while, we may have lost our way. I think now, though, there's a renewed interest. We've cr recently created a partnership like one that exists in Long Beach, which is we are partnering with Los Angeles Unified School District, Garfield High School specifically because they're our biggest feeder, um, and Cal State Los Angeles, and we're nudging UCLA to join um, to really create that guaranteed pipeline. And, you know, they're calling it cradle to college. Really, that's what it is. And beginning in the elementary school, not just us offering courses there, but having students come to us. It's amazing in these conversations that we're having when parents are like, oh, yeah, I drive by the college, but I've never set foot. There's something wrong with that. And so we're really striving to provide programming um, opportunities for the community to come to, to the campus. We can go to them all we want, but they need to know it's their home. It's, it's in the community, right? It's East LA College, for goodness sake. East LA should be present on the college campus. Um, so I'll just leave you with a, a few things. Um, besides the partnership um, that we're doing, um, one of the interesting things in where Chicano Studies comes in is that from the beginning, when they first started collaborating, the school district specifically, um, K through 12, said Chicano studies has to be a part of this. Ethnic studies has to be a part of this. Um, perhaps it's because so many of our, our, our local community um, advocates um, have gone through these programs, but they feel like this is a place where um, we can play a role, an institutional role, um, but a role in our communities. And so every time I, I some, I haven't been able to go to some of the planning meetings, and I, I get my dean who pulls on me and says, hey, they said Chicano Studies, you, could, you know, this is going to be the pipeline. I think that's true. Uh, we are very much prominent. Um, we were part of the Adelante First Year Experience Program, where classes in Chicano Studies um, were the required classes, and it was a cohort model to get students um, the summer before they began um, as freshmen um, to get them to finish, transfer in the shortest possible amount of time. Um, and now with the first year experience programs that have been funded and are growing, we're seeing that Chicano Studies, Ethnic Studies programs are going to be an integral part of that. Because if we're targeting our students to graduate, then we know that what we do can work. And so in this, in this era of assessment, and full disclosure, I'm a learning assessment facilitator on my campus, um, a lot of what we do in Ethnic Studies is best practices. What we haven't necessarily done is, is promote ourselves or, or find ways of demonstrating in the ways that we're told to, right? They want data, they want, they, want, they want the proof. We don't even have to work that hard to do it. We just have to start documenting what we already do. And I think that that's one of the things that, that we're finding um, at our college. Um, so real quick before um, I move on, just um, uh, some of the things that we do in our department, we're really trying to improve our transfer um, rates and every fall now, we hold a um, transfer workshop where we bring in faculty. And faculty is really important. We bring counselors in, too, but faculty from the different Chicano Studies programs uh, in the region. Um, and, and they come and they present. And they say, come to us. We want you. Um, and that's really made a difference. We transfer most of our students to Cal State um, Los Angeles. Um, the next largest group of students transfers to UCLA and then to Cal State Northridge. So that's pretty good, and it's, it increases as we begin to make those connections. Just future directions. You know, one of the things that, that's happened is that a lot of what we're doing really, I think, has, has, has flourished in the last, I would argue, seven to ten years. And a lot of it has been really making key faculty hires. And this is where faculty make a difference. Um, I think um, for a long time there was a lot of inertia. And, and, and to some extent, maybe we're kind of where we were allowed to be marginalized. Um, 
Cesar um, Lopez put up the picture of the bungalow where you guys were at. We're still in a bungalow, right? Um, we've been in a bungalow. Chicano Studies Department has never not been in a temporary bungalow. In 2015, we will finally be moving into our new Student Success Building. But it was because people finally said, why aren't we on the list to be in a real building, right? So it does require work, and yes, Ethnic studies faculty, counselors, uh, staff are often the folks that have to work the hardest because we need to be heard. Um, so I welcome the opportunity to dialogue with you. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Val, as I said, I'm a director of external relations at Trust West. What I want to do is, first of all, thank all our panelists, uh, in particular uh, our professors who let us know what the academic impact and um, intent and what the purpose is behind uh, ethnic studies, Chicano, Latino studies, African American studies. And I also, although she uh, walked away, uh, that includes a uh, pro professor who was just here a second ago, but also, most importantly, I want to recognize Assemblymember Weber. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I work in the intersection of practice, uh, politics, and policy. And there's no uh, other champion like anyone else in Sacramento right now than Dr. Shirley Weber. The value and the critical importance of, of ethnic studies to some major policy changes and shifts that we've had in California, particularly around education funding, and also uh, strategies for how are we going to close uh, opportunity uh, achievement and opportunity gaps particularly for our historically underserved students. The history of being underserved is really uh, uh, embedded in what uh, Dr. Gradia said about uh, really a sense of, of uh, a lack of respect for uh, difference. And because of that, that's where we see uh, the numbers and the trends, right? The pipeline. So let's talk about the pipeline, early childhood to uh, uh, at graduate education. And this is uh, systemic and holistic. And so I'm going to focus a little bit on K-12 and where the relevance is for ethnic studies. The notion of, of uh, historical, uh, the whole historical notion of underserving students means that we also need to have folks who understand that to get to where we're going to historically start serving all students, right? And that's one of the value adds for this type of um, scholarship. I have uh, some background working in um, higher ed. I started off as a student affairs professional at two and four year universities, particularly uh, a little famous uh, private university called Occidental College that a certain president has made a little more famous. Um, he had a lot of fun there, apparently. And um, I worked at uh, Santa Ana College and Cal State Long Beach, Cal State San Marcos. I was here in San Diego for a while. So I understood what the impact was. I worked in, at equity programs, at EOP programs, working with the low-income students. How do we support the success of our students? But at the time, I realized that uh, we were beginning to see our infrastructure crumble, uh, more crowded classrooms. And I knew there was a disconnect for how we were serving students with what policymakers, elected policymakers, were doing around a key issue, which is funding. And so I had the opportunity to work for the chair at the time of the Assembly Committee on Higher Ed. So all of a sudden, I learned about all the decisions that get made in Sacramento that impact everybody's life here. Uh, needless to say, uh, I realized about the irrelevance of the pipeline, so then I became the chief of staff to a school board member, Los Angeles Unified. And that was my boot camp in urban education. Um, and now I work for an advocacy organization that's trying to bridge all those experiences and, and use it for the sake of furthering our community, like what many do when they are students and scholars in ethnic studies. We know that the opportunity gaps that exist uh, have been historical, and we've tried for many years to close those gaps. But I can tell you that there are many people who are hard-worn soldiers that are 40, 50 years old and say, I still remember that gap. I thought we were working so hard to close it. And you see our youth struggling with it to this day. So it means we've got to shift. We've got to think outside the box. And one of the opportunities that we've had is through this new funding formula in California. It's called Local Control Funding Formula. How many of you have heard of it already? And what we've done is we've shifted the way we're funding schools in California. 
We are now, we went from this old archaic way of funding schools to say we're going to have this simplistic formula that says we're going to give every student school district a base amount for just the existing of students to cover basic ed. And then we're going to take three sets of students that we know historically have been underserved. English language learners, low income students, and foster youth. Now, the percentage of students of color in California, we have 53% now of our public schools, K-12, are, are serving Latino students. When you add African American students, Asian American students, that means that the majority of students are that old notion of minority. California students look like the folks here. This is California students. If you go into a classroom, you're going to see that reflected in today's classrooms in many ways. What we've decided is that for those students and those higher need uh, uh, experiences, we're going to add some extra funding to go to their districts. And there's real important language around that that the legislature passed. And Dr. Weber is key right now to making sure that we stick to the fidelity of that intent, which is that we will use those dollars to increase and improve services for the sake of furthering educational outcomes for those students that we know we have to make more investments in. But there's always stakeholders in education. Every, everybody's an expert in education. You either live near a school, you work for a school, you went to a school, you pay for a school, you buy cookies for a school, whatever it might be. Um, and, and, and the notion is, is that we need folks to fight hard to preserve those dollars, to make sure that districts will spend those dollars on the programs for African American students, Latino students, English learners, in ways that will increase and improve services to get them to the success that the pipeline demonstrates we have to address. Right? The challenge is, is that um, there's no requirement right now by the state board that says districts must do that. But the key thing is the governor was very clear. He said local control is about local communities coming together and having an input on how those dollars will be spent in their communities. So when I think about the notion that our first speaker talked about, that ethnic studies is about creating civic participation and responsibility, this is the training ground for you to then take that information. If how many of you are parents? Okay. You take this information and you go ahead and you learn the knowledge and we go back to conversations in our community and apply it to real life. Local control means local community folks like you and districts across California will help determine and make sure that we spend the money in ways that will impact students positively. And that's where the intersection comes between the critical value of this kind of work in academia and how it informs us to be the type of citizens that will advance democracy and help us address those gaps and opportunity that we've seen historically. And the chance exists now. Right now is the first year Look up your school district. Find out where they're having these conversations. But I want to tell you, there's lots of different perspectives because local control means everybody gets to have a say. And not everybody's an ethnic studies major. You know that, right? And so I was thinking about some of the policy work, and right this month, in, last month in February, Assemblymember Luis Alejo, he decided to, uh, to, to sponsor a bill called Assembly Bill 1750 which is going to create a task force to look at the possibility of best practices for curriculum and resources for a possible ethnic studies K-12 curriculum, frameworks, etc. It's going to create a $125,000 study to see what are the best ways we can implement that, maybe make it a mandatory part of it, maybe not, maybe make it elective. But the point is the possibility is just to take this type of scholarship and apply it to our, our youth, who dem definitely demonstrate Along the pipeline, there's a role for that kind of work. And when I was looking up this bill, which by the way will be heard next month in the uh, Education Committee of the Assembly, so if you want to look it up and write a letter of support, I'm sure he would appreciate it. I don't work for him, by the way. Um, and, and what I noticed was that I was looking up some information about it, and I can't, I, I do communications. I do um, government affairs, I do community engagement for my org, but I'm always interested in what are people thinking and saying. So I can't help myself. How many of you always look at articles and you immediately go to the comments? You want to see what people are saying. And oftentimes the comment section is people get real. I mean, because it can be anonymous. You don't know who the hell they are. They can say what they want. And you get some
some interesting things. And one of the things I saw in the comment section when somebody was talking about this particular bill, they said some key things. One of them, uh, I won't say the name, said, most kids in Cali's public education system, according to the Department of Ed data, can't read, write, or perform mathematical operations at grade level. Better work on resolving those issues first before traipsing off into fantasy worlds. And I thought, but I just saw information that talked about this is about critical education. This is about rigor and relevance and teaching how to communicate and write. And so there's a disconnect in terms of a public's awareness of what is the value of this type of education. And he's not the only one who's confused. Because another person said, what part of California are they referring to when they say Latinos are 53%? Mm, public school system, but never mind. <laughs> if you travel to Orange County, the Bay Area, Santa Barbara, Napa, and more affluent communities, I don't think so. But they're referring to third world LA. The, if they're referring to third world LA, then these stats make sense. No, I'm referring to the whole state. The state public school system serves 53% Latino students. Uh, if students want to take ethnic studies, they need to pay for it at colleges and universities. What these school systems need to do is teach kids critical thinking and good old fashioned reading, writing, and math. Wait a minute, I just thought that's what, is that what it does? So I think that's what we're talking about, the disconnect of there is unpacking and then appealing we need to do because at the heart of it is do we really value and are we doing our best to be the ambassadors, the representatives, show people, demonstrate this is the value of this work because I want us to know what we're up against. There's misperceptions. Just like uh, Dr. Tapia mentioned is that, or, or Professor Tapia mentioned is, oh, it's for those students, it's just for them, it makes kids feel good. But the reality is it has real life impact. It can inform how we make spending decisions at local school districts that can then turn around and help address the same cycles of achievement gaps that have historically addressed and impacted communities. And it also can help other people who aren't touched by English learners, foster youth or impact, uh, low-income students, to do what the professor, good professor said here, is see ourselves in them. Because it's when we see the collective perspective of why it's important to do that, then we make change, systemic change. And so that's what I leave you with, is some information about local control funding formula. That's what I work on. There's some information back there. Here's a community guide in English and Spanish. Some information even in Chinese. But most of all, learn about it. Take the knowledge that you're learning here in your coursework and go into your communities and figure out how do we apply it in everyday policy decision making. And I guarantee you that the more people that do that, then we'll start to see some change. Because in, I'm going to tell you, in Sacramento, people making education decisions, they don't look like this room. I think you not. I go up there and I think like, you all know there's 53% Latino students in California, aren't right? And when you add in all other kids of color, there's like 70%. And we're serving 6.2 million students, right? You know that, right? And 1.4 million of them are English learners. You know that, right? You guys don't look anything like them. So I think that's the issue, is that if they don't look anything like them, we better make sure that the impact of this critical scholarship is valued, because they don't have to look like them. They have to see them in themselves. And that's what the value of this work is. And that's why I thank you all for the work that you do. And I want you to know that this is the work that has influenced my life and my lens as an advocacy advocate now in Sacramento, in communities, to make sure that we are, in fact, marrying the opportunity with the resources, with the knowledge, with the relevance of these ethnic studies. Thank you so much for your time. up just a little bit because I like to teach outside the box. And I'm going to kind of just give you a flavor of, of what some of our Black Studies classes look like. So picture this the first day of school. My name is Starla Rosette Lewis. I was born December 20th, 1949 in a colored hospital in Springfield, Missouri. I was born to teenage parents, Rose Carolyn England Lewis 
and Alan Lee Lewis. I was born one day after Rose's 18th birthday, so I like to think of myself as a belated birthday kid. <laughs> I'm the granddaughter of Rosa Irene Ford England and Guy Littleton England, Alice Lorraine Lewis Nichols Bagley and an unknown white man. I am the great, 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 great niece of Katie Elizabeth White Boyd, who was born in 1880 on a plantation in Missouri. She lived to be 100 years old, so she went to the ancestors in 1980. She was my first black studies professor because she was living history. And she was my best friend because we hung like that. <laughs> I share that because I believe that diversity is about connection. And I believe that we make connections when we're willing to reveal some of our authentic self. And I think that when one of the challenges in education is that we don't reach before we teach. Right now, there are two women making a whole bunch of money off of a book called Reach Before You Teach. I wish I had wrote it. <laughs> but it is a sound principle that before you pull people in, you have to let you out. And so the connection within the classroom has to be made. We look at the dropout rates K through, two, I mean K through 12, well some drop out in third grade, but we look at the dropout rates in, in elementary and high school, and we don't understand that part of that is because teachers are missing a fundamental principle, and that fundamental principle that Dr. Asa Hilliard spoke of was that before you walk into a classroom, you should love your students. So on the first day of class, I tell my students, that the night before the first day of class for me is like a child the night before Christmas. I can't sleep, I'm excited, because when I walk into the classroom, I'm going to see all my gifts, and I have a whole semester to open them. See, we have to start to acknowledge that the young people that come into our classes, they're already brilliant. They already want to know. They already want to learn, or they wouldn't have come here. But the challenge is if the educational institution turns the learning off. How do we turn the learning off? Because first of all, they're coming here seeking truth. They want to learn how to deal with the world. They want to learn how to have a career. They want to learn how to take care of themselves. And often we just give them a lot of blah, 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 blah. Facts, figures, statistics, that they do, and then we don't show them what to do with them. I tell my students, the purpose of education is knowledge of self. You are math, you are science, you are history, you are technology. And when they start to see themselves in the curriculum, that is when they begin to connect and engage. I tell them the only goal that I have for them is that they become independent learners, independent researchers, analytical thinkers in awe of no one. And I tell them to rescue me when I'm wrong, Dr. Karanga. In other words, we have to stop thinking that because I'm the PhD in the classroom, that I have all the knowledge and all the information. Our life stories are filled with wisdom and experiences that have helped us understand things theorists still don't even know. I remember when I was teaching at Palomar College, which was my first job, teaching black studies in North County in 1974. You know I didn't have no black students. <laughs> and my other students were telling me, you're the first black person I've ever talked to. <laughs> and so I know that people are open. People are open to learning about one another. And so we have to insist that the curriculum become diverse as the population that we call the United States of America. I meet people who say things like, now that America is becoming diverse, when wasn't America diverse? It was diverse when the European came, because the African had already been here. Stop me when I lie. And we don't teach that K through 12. We don't even teach that in the university. You have to take a special class to make that connection. I teach and have taught at an amazing institution where black studies and Chicano studies are one. We have not had one incident between us in the 20 years that I've been here. What other departments can say that about their internal department? <laughs> we, we, in black studies, have brought in amazing faculty, diverse backgrounds. Why? Because our children come from diverse backgrounds. We have an English teacher who teaches in high school who can teach our students when they come in below academic standards 
but by the time they leave her classroom, they have publishable work. And then it's not acknowledged, it's like, well, is she really qualified? Who gets to determine what, who in black studies is qualified? Who has studied black studies enough to know what it takes to be a black studies professor? Most black studies professors didn't even get degrees in black studies. I wanted one. I remember the day I figured out I was going to be a black studies professor. It was the night after my first black studies class. I sat in the class and, and I heard the teacher speaking and I said, wait a minute, I have a high school diploma. I've been to school for 12 years and I don't need any of this stuff. And I realized that this was the stuff that I had needed in order to understand why I wasn't inferior. I'm mean, like, I knew I wasn't inferior, but I didn't have any ammunition to argue the point. And society was sending me all these other kind of messages. I said, this is the stuff that my friends needed. Because I had all kind of diverse friends to know who I am. Because people can't like who people don't know. And I didn't want an image of me. And I was tired of people telling me, you know, you're not like other black people. <laughs> oh, you, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, I am. And I realized that this was the information that my teachers needed because teachers can't teach who teachers don't know. Right. You gotta make the connection. Amen. And see, we need to understand that we live in a society, and I'm a child of the 60s, Hollywood. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and in the 60s, we saw people dying in the streets. We saw dogs put on people. We saw that with our own eyes. And I realized that this was the information that my nation needed in order to not self-destruct. Because every great empire falls from within. And so armored with those thought forms, I said, I'm going to teach black studies. I went to my counselor. I told him, he said, <clears throat> well, Starla, why don't you major in something more traditional? You know, black studies. What are you going to do with a degree in black studies? So I went to my black studies professor. I was so excited. I said, Dr. J, I'm going to major in black studies. She says, well, Starley, you know, they only gave us that because of the riots. We don't know how long it's going to be wrong, around, so you might want to major in something more traditional. I was like, what? I went home. I saw my dad. He was, I said, Daddy, I know I'm going to major. And he goes, because he had been asking me. He said, what? I said, black studies. He said, that black shit ain't never going to get you nothing. <laughs> And armored with all that support, I tried to make it in black studies, only to find there was no degree. But in my infinite wisdom, because I believe we all have infinite wisdom, I took every black studies class I could get my hands on. I transferred to San Diego State. I hung out with the black studies department. I, I got enough units to have a degree in black studies, but there was still no degree. So I majored in counseling and I majored in psychology because they said that was connected. Got married, went on honeymoon, came back. Palomar, I mean, um, you know, Palomar College was trying to reach me from a place called San Marcos. I hadn't heard of either. <laughs> but they were, they said you had been recommended to teach behavioral science from a black perspective. I was like, what? <laughs> so walking all that pavement to get that first job that lasted ten years, I went to Palomar College, and then I came to San Diego, and then I was trying to find a job in black studies, and I was an adjunct. And I want to honor anyone who's ever been an adjunct for five, nine, ten years. Because that shows your commitment to your craft right. and your desire to change lives in the community college system. But I want to say this, black studies is just like the community college system. Black, black studies have the same status as black people. What is that in the United States of America? That's called zero status. And the community college and academia in comparison to the university has zero status. And if you start to understand that as a community college, then you will start to value the multi-ethnic departments that, that bring in the, the, the truth about education in the same way the community college brings in the truth about education. It, all people, no matter what background they come from, is brilliant. And we miss the brilliance of our huge population because we have standards that block people from getting in. Mm -hmm. The community college in its inception was what? Supposed to be free. I know, because mine was. Paid for books and health. 
The community college in its section was supposed to open doors to anybody. I'm not going to look at your GPA. Why? Because if you know anything about an F student, you can't measure that. That was the kid that didn't read the book, didn't perform. You can't measure that. So why are we blocking them from the opportunity of higher education? Because they were bored out their gourd K-12. <laughs> See, we have to redefine education and learning and what it means if we're going to meet the needs of our society. We have what we call standards. But if we remember EOPS was created and those standards were changed, not lowered, changed. And those students who came in under EOPS that did drop out of school, dropped out for financial reasons, not because they couldn't intellectually handle the curriculum. And one of our challenges is some, our K through 12 has failed a lot of students. I've had students that couldn't read. I could have penalized them for that, but I balanced it out by saying, can you speak? Well, because if you can speak and you can't read and you get an F and you get an A, you get a C. And you can still move through the institution. And then you can go on. And we have story after story of student after student who came in one way and left another. Yeah. And we document, we've got probably about 100 videotapes of students saying in their own words what they got out of the class. And we have students from UCLA, we have students from USC, we have students, and I'm serious, from UCSD, and we have a student from UCSD, I'll never forget him, he was an Asian student, and he said everyone should be required to take black studies and Chicano studies and women's studies because before you become a teacher, before you become a doctor, before you become a politician, before you become a scientist, first you should become human. <laughs> Part of my, my challenge for all of us is to remember that we can get in the box and stay in the box or we can stretch that box until it bursts. We can transform education to meet the needs of all of our children. We can make education relevant to living our daily lives. And that does not in any way diminish research and study and analysis. In fact, it fuels it. I have students who have taken black studies classes far beyond anything they needed to transfer or get an AA degree. And I ask them, why are you, you know, why are you taking class? And they say, because the classes get me to campus, and since I'm in campus, I go to my other class. <laughs> See, we have to start to acknowledge the value of things that we have, rather than constantly question or constantly, in many ways, envy the full classes. Envy the love of students for their professors. Envy because you don't understand. I had a colleague, European American colleague, sitting in the back of my class one day. I, it was first day of class. I thought she was um, at taking the class. And so I always ask my students, why are you here and what do you want to get out of this? And so when I got to her, she said, oh, I'm not in the class. She said, I just came to get the inspiration. Education is supposed to be inspiring. It's supposed to be fun. I have a very low tolerance for boredom. Very low. <laughs> And so I understand that if we can make our classes engaging, that we can involve the students' genius, we can ask them what do you want to know, and then giving them, guide them in the directions where what they want to know and what we're doing in the class is connected. I ask my students questions I already know the answers to. Why? Because I want them to know they already know stuff, that they just didn't come here a blank slate, and that my job is to put stuff in their heads. See, they are physics, they are energy in motion, they are heat, they are vibrating, and they need to understand that. And every other discipline, the challenge is to make that connection for us. I think it's important to understand that in the 40 years of teaching that I've done, every institution I've ever worked with really doesn't understand ethnic studies. When you want to take black studies, Chicano studies, Asian studies, Native American studies, and not have them as full departments, yeah. you don't get it. That's right. Because the dilution that takes place in a multicultural studies department is really what's supposed to be happening across the curriculum. Yeah. 
a little bit of this and a little bit of that in history, a little bit of this and a little bit of that in English, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Because in every class, whether you take a multicultural studies class or not, you should be learning about yourself. There was a principal in Pinisquita, an amazing woman, and she went into the, the school, and the school was very diverse. The staff wasn't. She said, okay, this is the deal. She said, well, I'm going to write a grant, and I'm going to get money so that you can go and take courses on diversity because you have a very diverse population here. And you have to diversify your curriculum. And they did that. She said, any teacher that doesn't want to participate, just send me your request for transfer. She lost half her staff. But that's okay. She had a backup plan. The other staff that wanted to come in and do that. And so when you walked into the, to talk about math, the major math professor was an African-American woman. When you wanted to take language, the major Spanish teacher was an African-American. Are you following? In other words, we, you don't have to look it, but you have to know it. And if you don't know it, you can't reach those students in the same way. Her campus was the only campus in San Diego County where there was zero violence. And there was zero violence because she nipped it in the bud in terms of how people were allowed to communicate with one another. She said no one on this campus will call any child, because we forget the teacher's name called too, or any student outside of the name that they tell you they want to be called. And if you do, it was treated the same way as if you had smacked them in the face. I watched young boys of all ethnicities look at this teacher and cry when they were graduating from the sixth grade. Look, it's not rocket science. It's humanity. And our challenge is to teach the truth. Don't put me in an anthropology class if I don't understand that the human family began on the part of the world that we now call Africa. And don't put me in a sociology class that talks about races when you just told me the human family is one. Are you following? That'd be truth seekers. Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I don't think any teacher should walk into a classroom without having read this book. It's called The Miseducation of the Negro by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And what Dr. Woodson said, if the Negro is miseducated, then we have all been miseducated because we're getting the same information. And so what I want to uh, close by saying I want to share when I found out I was African. And this is relevant to why ethnic studies is so important. My parents desegregated Altadena, California. I was going to school. They told me I probably wouldn't see very many black kids or children of color. Actually, they said colored kids or Negroes. And I walked into this, in my classroom, and I was the only black child in the class. But lunchtime came, and I looked up on the campus, and I was the only black child in the school. And I was like, oh, hope somebody talks to me. <laughs> Sharon did. We went back to class, and the teacher said, we're going to talk about our ancestry and where we came from. And I'm hearing Scotch and Irish and Dutch and German and French. And I'm sitting there thinking, there's no Negro land. <laughs> you know, where do Negroes come from? <laughs> I'm nine years old, and I have no clue. And my teacher comes up, and she puts her hands on my shoulder, and then she says, and as we all know, Starla's ancestors came from Africa. <laughs> Why didn't my parents tell them? tell me that because they had been miseducated. Why did my great, great, great aunt Kate not tell me that? But when I called her, she said, oh yeah, baby, my daddy was an African. She said, but that was a long time ago. We're all mixed up. <laughs> we are mixed up. We're confused. And when our children walk into classrooms, they're confused about who they are. A young black man at Mesa College who was helping me down the stadium stairs, because when we take faculty pictures, they have, a, they have people to help those ladies, you know? <laughs> and I, I said to him, are you, taking, are you taking a black studies class? He said, why would I want to do that? I'm from Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, don't assume that because people are black, they know who they are. Well, because we have been miseducated. We have been Eurocentrized. Yeah. And if we don't learn that 
Black studies, Chicano studies, bring something to the institution that can help expand and make all the disciplines more better. Because they will stretch us to think outside the box and we will be allowed to reach more people. I lied. This is the last thing I'm going to say. <laughs> I had a student when I, when I was teaching history, because remember, when I got here, I was the department by default. <laughs> and I was teaching seven classes, seven preps, and I was department chair. And somewhere I know that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> See, I know that we can bend the rules when we want to. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and yeah. I had a student from UCLA, an Asian student, who had come and taken my summer school class. And when she left, she wrote me this wonderful letter. And she said, I was in my last semester at UCLA. I'd been trying to take US history. I kept falling asleep in class. I'm a science major. My sister goes here at Mason. She said, come to Mason, take the class here. She said, so that's why I'm here to get my, to get my history requirement out the way. She said, not only did I not fall asleep in the class, the class was 8 o'clock in the morning, and I was worried that my alarm wouldn't go off and I would miss something. You want to be engaging. You want to be truth-seeking. And all that, for me, is academic. Knowing something about culture and cultural competence, anyone who organized a panel for 50 minutes with five people of color to talk, <laughs> obviously hasn't been a person of color very long. <laughs> um, I thought maybe y'all had a different kind of mixture going on here that I didn't know anything about, because when I looked at the program, I said, this ain't going to work. <laughs> um, so I just text my person telling them I'd be late to my next meeting at 11. Um, let me simply say that it, is, it has been a, a, a real good pleasure and joy to listen to uh, my colleagues or former colleagues, one, to, who are still in the field, uh, to talk about their work in ethnic studies and what it means. And, um, uh, to students and to um, what we do uh, to educate young people in California. Um, I've had the great fortune of, of transitioning to the State Assembly uh, in the last year and in a time obviously of great excitement because in the short year to be able to be engaged in some very marvelous work and, and have some opportunities to continue to do some marvelous things on behalf of the young people of California that I served for 40 years as a professor at State. Um, let me just give you a little bit of, of some of the things that, that we're confronted with. Um, recently, some of you may have seen it, some of you told me you saw this on YouTube, recently um, on the floor of the assembly during Black <coughs> History Month, I think it may have been February the 10th, because the thing kind of went viral. Uh, we were talking about the importance of Black History Month and the importance of um, studying African-American history. And we had lots of people who got up and talked about uh, various heroes and heroines and things you need to know. And, um, and I think those things are very important, as I pointed out to my colleagues. But I said to them that the unique thing about the study of history uh, is that history is the one subject we study every day of, our, of every year of we're in school. And I said, and it's not because people can't remember dates and times and places and people. It is because the study of history, particularly U.S. history and even world history, is really the study that is the development of the character of the individual who's doing the studying. And in the process of studying American history, you are making the American personality, the culture. You're also creating for that young person their vision of themselves and what they will be in the future. You're studying the great things of life, and people see themselves in that, and therefore are inspired to believe that whatever happened in the past, they can do it in the future. So when you eliminate history, when you eliminate the study of African Americans, you eliminate the study of uh, Latinos, you eliminate the study of women, you basically rip out their uh, ability to see themselves in the future as excellent individuals capable of running the world, capable of positive change. And that we know that Paulo Fierre and others have told us over the years in Pedagogy of the Oppressed 
that the first thing that happens when you conquer a people is you destroy their knowledge of self. You destroy their knowledge of the past because once you do that, then you can reconstruct their past in any image that you choose and therefore limit their ability to move forward. So um, I said that on the floor, and of course it went viral immediately. People appreciated it, and it's on YouTube, I understand, and everywhere else. But it's important that we understand what we're engaged in. Uh, too often, uh, I know when I was a student at UCLA um, taking some education courses, uh, I had to remind people that education is a political act. It is not some apolitical activity you engage in, some intellectual discussion of the stars and the skies that you can sit around and philosophize about and go do something else later on. That's right. Education is a political act. And the act of educating in young people is a process of sustaining the institutions that currently exist. And, um, you know, it's, it's when Audre Lorde was saying, you can't destroy the master's house with the master's tools, that is so true, and education is one of those tools. Right. So sometimes you have to rewrite and redesign the tools. Come on, sure. um, interestingly enough, when I got to the assembly last year, uh, the first thing that hit my desk were letters. And I, I'm a member of the Legislative Black Caucus, which I think is, um, there are nine of us in the assembly. Uh, I, the Black Caucus, it, it, even though it's the smallest caucus now, is considered by many in the state capitol, it's probably the most powerful caucus, the most focused caucus. Uh, and we take on some critical areas and agendas that, uh, that seem like uh, things that a small caucus wouldn't take on, like local control funding formula, that was really going down at some point until the caucus got engaged with the governor and the speaker to make sure that we stayed focused, because many didn't want to do it. Even Democrats didn't want to do local control funding formula. But I had to shame some people uh, into understanding the necessity of what we call ourselves to be in terms of leaders and, and leading folks uh, instead of following them. That as an elected official, it is not my task to put my finger to the wind and then follow the crowd, but to, to, to educate the crowd and to lead them where I know California should be going. So, you know, so there are a lot of things that are happening with regards to where we are and the kinds of challenges we face. Um, and so the first opportunity I had, interestingly enough, was to get a letter from uh, San, Cal State Long Beach. And uh, the Black Caucus had decided that its two pillar um, uh, focus for the, uh, for the coming two years, every year we meet, and we, every two years we meet and decide what, what's going to be our focus for the two years, and sometimes we carry them forward. And we assessed a lot of things, and we said there are two things that are critical for African Americans in California. One is education, and the other one is what we call black enterprise, which is jobs, opportunity, and economic development. And so we decided to focus on those two issues, so immediately we get a letter from Cal State Long Beach concerning a black studies department at Cal State Long Beach. And, um, and, we, and, and it was in the process that, we, that they were basically getting ready to take the departmental status and turn it into a program. Yeah. And um, probably had I not been there, we would have just said, oh wow, what can we do? But coming out of black studies, people immediately said, you know, you're the educator, you're going to leave this issue for us, what should we do? Well, we immediately began to get engaged and find out what was going on. And of course, as most situations, we had been in a budget crisis, and I've having come out of San Diego State and fought a budget crisis, that the first thing that happens in budget crisis is people who are traditionally your friend start uh -huh. looking who they can devour. Uh -huh. And it turns out to be the poor people of color and the yeah. women and everybody else. And the women's group has got so large now they can't devour them, but they start eating everybody else, yeah. all the other programs, because now it's, a, it's no longer we love each other and share. It's no longer a kumbaya experience. It's one of those we left on a boat and drowned. And should we eat you first and somebody else later? So it's a totally different reality that you face at that particular moment. And so ethnic studies had become the group that had been whittled away and, and eaten at. And then, and then after that, it says, oh my goodness, you don't reach, reach this, maintain the standards of being a department anymore. Uh, because of these requirements we have that you no longer meet, that they created the circumstances themselves in terms of eating away at the department. It was interesting that all of this happened and Black Cops had taken a position concerning it and written a letter to the president at uh, Cal State Long Beach, who probably didn't take the caucus very seriously, which was a mistake on his part. And uh, because it, right after that, the new chancellor comes in and we are having a tea party, cheese and crackers, they love to eat, you know, wine, cheese, whatever it is, with the president, with the new, with the new chancellor. And um, 
we, he thought we talked about these big broad issues, and we did talk about a number of broad issues, but then we talked about one very specific issue, and that was ethnic studies in the Cal State system. And uh, we let him know in no uncertain terms that we were not going to participate in all this other stuff he had on his agenda for us to help him raise this and do that and be here and be there if he was not committed to ethnic studies. But ethnic studies have been an integral part of, of our lives and, and an integral part of the, of the campuses. And so as a result of getting the ear of the chancellor and helping him to understand why he should be engaged, uh, we then were able to get the resolute, we get his commitment in writing that they were going to put a moratorium on the, decree, the declining uh, ethnic studies programs in terms of taking the programs from departmental status, I mean departmental status to program status, for two years to talk about the value of ethnic studies. Then we codified it by a resolution, I think it was resolution ACR 72, I believe, that I authored and put on the floor of the assembly. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was unanimously approved by all members of the state assembly. We had individuals who got up and talked about the value of ethnic studies to them, their wives, their lives. And these are people of color, but there were also non people who were white who talked about why ethnic studies had been important in their academic life. That the courses they took that may have inspired them, that the faculty who kept them on campuses, and a host of things. And then we had a hearing at the state capitol where many of the uh, leaders in ethnic studies came, Africana studies and others, came to the campus to talk about uh, what their expectations were. And, and interestingly enough, members and, 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 and employees from the state came to our hearing at the state building from all the, all the offices came in and many of them afterwards talked about how ethnic studies had been that linchpin, that really important piece that kept them in the institution engaged. So we were able to pass the resolution and, and keep off, and now there is a statewide commission that's looking at ethnic studies. My position to my colleagues was California has a, has a jewel in ethnic studies. I served for a number of years, four years, as president of the National Council for Black Studies. And in that time, we've often done a lot of research and study. You know, not only did we have the first ethnic studies department in terms of San Francisco State, but when you start looking across the state and looking at the state institutions, we have more ethnic studies in terms of Africana studies, Chicano studies, women's studies, more ethnic studies departments than any other state. And departments that are offering degrees and, and helping our students to go and to develop. And so that becomes important that California recognizes in the resolution, it recognizes ethnic studies as a value to California, particularly a state that's becoming more and more diverse, that this is a value, this is something, a treasure that we should keep and not something that we should ignore. It's important as we look at this, this particular effort, that um, we, are, we are still in the process now because there's a commission that's been formed um, to basically continue to work uh, to make sure that ethnic studies is an integral part. One of the things that happened when I became the first committee meeting I went to in the Department of, with the Department of Education, uh, with our Education Committee, they talked about, and our Higher Ed Committee, uh, they talked about the fact that by 2020, maybe 2025, California will need at least two million more bachelor's degrees than it's currently on track to receive at this point. You know, and that's, a, that's rapidly approaching. That we have to produce two million more bachelor's degrees than we're on track to produce. And that, and that two million is to keep California functioning as a state. That the kind of retirements we're going to see, the kind of jobs that are going to be generated. In other words, if we're going to keep ourselves together economically, we have to produce these degrees, this higher level of learning for young people to be able to run California. For me, that's critical because now we can talk about the role of ethnic studies in, in recruiting and retaining students, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it saves California. And so it is an economic issue in California that we have to do this in order for California to function. I told um, my colleagues on the floor that I signed my last waiver that, um, I keep blocking on the number, but it's the, um, the uh, immigration uh, waiver, F something something, where we are constantly bringing in PhD immigrants to take jobs at UCSD and at Scripps and all around, because why? Because we're not educating the children here to take the science jobs that are available. I said, I'm not gonna import any more people because you folks better figure it out and get to the point where you educate the children who live in California to run those industries and those institutions up north. 
because we can no longer continue to incarcerate folks. We need to basically put in place individuals who are going to work. So let me just simply close because I know we're supposed to wrap it up at 11, that um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's a lot of opportunity uh, to be done in terms of what is happening in California. We are redesigning our whole educational funding program. Uh, we had a press conference yesterday I was a part of for First Five because as a part of the uh, Health and Human Services Committee, we're looking at what do we do for children from zero to three, because by three, the brain has been fully has been developed, and we're missing the opportunity to stimulate our children. So First Five has a new program called Read, um, Talk, and Sing that, that educate parents about what they need to do to help to develop the literacy skills and the critical thinking skills of their children. But we're also looking to see what we need to do in terms of our child care programs, uh, we're helping individuals to grow and develop community college will play a significant part in that. Uh, to get people prepared to deal with our children from birth until five because we miss a lot because when our kids end up in, in, in kindergarten, they're already sometimes 30,000 words behind other children and therefore the achievement gap has already begun. Uh, one of my bills is uh, also designed to make kindergarten mandatory. If people don't know you're not required to go to kindergarten in California. We think you are, but you're not. So I have a bill to make kindergarten mandatory and a bill to make kindergarten all day. Uh, you know, so, so that we can get to the point where we increase the standards for excellence for every child in California and begin to move forward an agenda that is a consistent agenda of excellence, but incorporating in that the individuals who we're here to serve, a very diverse population of California. Once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to serve you. We'd like to give the opportunity for you to ask questions to our remaining panelists. As you can imagine, Dr. Weber, uh, she was awesome, wasn't she? Yeah. 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 And all of our panelists were very, very awesome. Yeah. We yeah. want to acknowledge all of them and for taking the time out of their very busy schedules to come take and speak with us. And as you can see, the, the, uh, the effort to take and make sure that education is truly reflective of the diversity that we all are a part of is an ongoing effort, right? It's an ongoing effort. And so we would like to have the opportunity for you to ask our panelists questions in relationship to some of the things that you may have heard or if you'd like to take and give a comment about what you feel, about what you've heard today. Um, and just know that we, we do have this recorded, so if, any, if you miss any portion of that, you will be able to see that in, it, in, in, in its entirety. So, but I would like to make a brief comment before I open it up for questions for our panelists. And there were some very important things that were said here today. And one of them is that the economy of California will need to take and have the ethnic community be a vital part of that development and certainly that ethnic studies will be a catalyst for achieving that. Okay, And when we talk about closing the achievement gap, that means that something that might have been traditional may not be effective for everyone. And so the, the need for diversity is not just an inclusion of diverse people as was said before, the demographics, that the whole institution has to become diverse. That means to its core, in the same way that we talk about having core curriculum. right? The other thing I want to mention briefly is this idea of culture and creative industries. That, you know, for a very long time in the 20th century, we had the Industrial Revolution. And now, in the 21st century, we are moving to what's been called, through the scholarship, the conceptual age, right? And that conceptually beyond just knowing how to do tasks, we have to also conceptually know how to relate to the global community. And that cultural and creative industries are going to be vital to stimulating the place that America needs to be at to be a part of the global community. And certainly, ethnic studies programs can be in the avant-garde of leading our state and nation to rising back up to the place 
that we've heard over and over and over again. This is America is not in the place it used to be, and America has changed in a lot of different ways. And then how do we take from that change and make progress to be very expansive? And the cultural creative industries in the conceptual age is one thing that's real. It's happening. It's not something that's coming forward. And certainly culture plays an important part of that. And we're not just talking about tourism. We're talking about how people are interested in, in cultural identities that are important to stimulating the culture so that those dollars stay here and they and expand and grow. So with that being said, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll pass the mic to you. Sasan will pass the mic to you. And then please let us know which panelists you or to the panel as a whole. Hey, I don't see you. Can y'all hear me all right? Okay. okay. Well, first of all, I want to say to you, Tima, and Professor, I'm sorry. Lopez. Lopez, uh, my tools go out. Sound to sound for this. Putting this on, y'all did an excellent job and it's timely. By the way, I'm Minister Takufu Kalonji, and I'm a founder of Kabi African Ministry, and I'm a teacher without portfolio, and a soldier in the struggle for liberation. I think this is very key, and let me say, also to one of my mentors. My first black studies teacher at City College in 1984 after I got out of the Navy, I was 27 years old, uh, along with Professor Nathan Katuji, Ms. Starla Lewis, who was also a mentor for me to come back to higher learning and get my paper behind my name. So, who, Introduction to Black Sociology, Robert Staples' book, yes. Uh, and we've built a long time relationship, she's been a mentor of mine. My, everyone spoke to, everyone on the panel spoke to the criticalness of this and the need for black studies and Chicano studies, which we know grows out of the struggle for liberation that in 1976, during that period of the Black Power Movement, Dr. Nathan Hare, founding father of Black Studies, said we got to take the college to the community and the community to the campus, rather. Campus to the community, community to the campus. Therefore, it's not a, a, a separation between campus and community. And so with what's been said in the, I'm sorry, I forget your name, who deals with policy issues, what would y'all, all of y'all would say, how you, to us as community members who are seeking to become professors in ethnic studies, black studies, and community at large, and to the campus people here, how we build that bond so that we got a solid wall of, 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 of both offense and defense against the powers that be that are trying to eliminate these two departments. You know, you have to you have to incorporate it in your curriculum. For example, we have a class called Dynamics of the Black Community. At least half that class, we're out in the community. We're going to the different agencies. And this is key because what we've discovered is as students come to the campus to be educated from the community, they often don't even know the resources that they have in the community. I'll give one example. We went to the Elementary Institute of Science. It's been there at least 20 years, I think even longer than that. Uh, and we had students begin to weep because they lived around the corner and didn't even know what the building represented. And they had such an amazing experience seeing young people doing science, these kids going, winning awards all over, kids north of Ada trying to get in. Uh, and they have a space there, but kids in the community have priority. Also, service learning. All faculty are required to have service learning on their uh, syllabi. So we encourage students to go in and get involved in the things in the community. We take our students, a lot of our learning, and, and they can get what we call extra learning opportunities. They can go in to hear lectures. They've gone to hear lectures that you've done around the prison industrial yeah, complex. Right. We took them to U, uh, UCSD to hear Tim Wise speak on white privilege. They've met with... Um, it, that have been in our community, they've met with uh, Dick Gregory, they've met with um, Amiri Baraka, they met with, uh, the list goes on and on. Literally, we want them to meet the authors of their books. Yeah. So when the authors are in the vicinity, and we bring those authors, if we bring them to campus, we try to take them also into the community. Yeah. Renoko Rashidi, who talks about the African-Asian yeah. connection, the African-European connection, uh, uh, Chuck Ambers has the museum in Old Town. They get extra credit for going and learning how to curate a museum. And so there's many, many opportunities that we can create in our curriculum 
that takes them to the community. And then the events that we do here, we advertise in the community to bring the community to us. Um, I, I think that what you're talking about is very important, and I think that that's something that we've really um, been working to try to do. Um, some of our last hires, there's, we've attempted to, to emphasize that it's, it has to be people who are incorporating this into their, their teaching methodologies and everything else. So um, it is this, 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 we talk about this, the, it's the community and it's the, the and then it's the institution. We're community colleges and I think we have to remember that, that is, that's what we are. And so when we do create programs, um, we have students who do similar projects. We don't do so much the service learning, but a lot of our courses have that component. Um, we work very closely with the women's, um, the East LA Women's Center, um, and a lot of our students do um, become advocates or they become uh, volunteers um, working with women who are experiencing violence, things like that. We also have a, a link with the arts community, our local arts community. We actually had students um, in one of the, the Chicano art classes interview local East LA artists, um, interview them, they put together um, the interviews and then they put together a, a they curated many exhibits on each of our local artists and then we went out to one of the community galleries um, called um, Avenue 54 and they and we had probably about it's a tiny little space we must have had about a hundred or so people coming through the doors to check it out um, to get to meet the artists and to talk to the students who had interviewed the artists so there's a lot of programs that we can do. Um, and, and really, I think students, you're correct, when they enter classes like that, they feel connected, and they want more. Yeah. And they stick around. They really do. Um, just really quick, I, I think there are different industries that are ahead of the curve in terms of diversity and understanding the value of diversity. I'll share this brief little anecdote. Uh, I put feelers out for students. I call my network of friends around the country. I usually have my African-American male students and Latino male students. Uh, after they graduate, they're like, what should I do? I said, do you like working with people or with paper? Two different options there, right? Um, and people will say people. And I call my friends at the different schools of social work around the country. That field is so far ahead in terms of USC, uh, University of Michigan, uh, the Ivy Leagues. They now no longer require the GRE because they know that our students will be blocked by such uh, exams from going into graduate programs. It's, it's so critical to have our men of color become social workers that many of these programs now say it's a two-year master's program and we will pay him to come here mm -hmm. because we need people who have ethnic studies training and background yes. to inspire and give hope to the children and the young men that they're working with in terms of the halfway homes, the prisons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So certain aspects of the economy has already shifted. We just need to make sure the shift keeps on happening. And it includes, and it includes activism in the sense of we have to overturn Prop 209. Yes. That has created a disaster for us in higher education. We have to work <coughs> towards changing the way in which standardized tests, because we are tested to death in the state. We have to really change the way we look at standardized tests, and we have to start asking universities, why are you using this tool? Because it doesn't work for us. And that's the next conversation. Just one last closing. It's not, not, a, not a question. I'm making a commitment to what we're talking about. And I'm doing it publicly, and y'all got me on tape. Y'all got everybody here that needs to know got my contact information. I'm making a commitment from, as a representative from the community to work in line with you, the team, and everyone, whoever else at this campus, and whoever we can bring from the community to do to keep these two departments alive. So I'm saying that, so I'll be looking to hear from you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's do this. There was a couple of here. Yeah. We'll go back. We'll go back. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, for being here. Thank you for putting this event together. It's been you know tremendous learning experience, and I really appreciate you all. I see it as nothing short than labor of love. You know, and it's so beautiful to hear that, you know, we need to come into our classrooms understanding that our students are worthy of love, you know. Because love is not something that we necessarily speak in academia, but it's such a necessary component to make it a meaningful experience. And I want to also applaud how courageous our students are that they've been here for a couple hours. 
learning and sticking around, and I really would want to applaud your, your courage, you know, for doing, being here. I got three questions, you know, in, in what I, um, in, in, so let me just put them out there. Um, I want to see if you have any recommendations as to how to partner up uh, black studies, Chicano studies, with the discussions that take place in sociology classes, because sociology classes bring a lot of these awareness to our classroom, but they're not necessarily seen as an integral component, so I don't know if there might be some partnership that you might have already done within your departments uh, with sociology instruction uh, in discussions on race, uh, class inequality, gender inequality, homophobia, you know, things that are important in our communities. You know, we're interdisciplinary. Black studies, Chicano studies, Asian studies, etc. We're interdisciplinary studies, so we're perfect for coming into different classrooms and doing guest lectures. We're perfect for having uh, teachers bring their classes into our classes. So that's just one way we do it. The other way is all the, the different events that we are involved in putting on, professors can take advantage of that as extra learning opportunities for their students and then have mutual dialogue with both or several professors. That's another way that we can do it. Um, the other piece is we have to be comfortable challenging information. Yeah. And so sometimes these things don't happen because sometimes what we're teaching is in conflict with, with what's being taught. Race does not exist. Anthropologists gave it up as a scientific term in the 1950s, but we still use it in political uh, science, uh, and we still use it in sociology. So we have to start to dialogue about things of that nature. But there's many, many ways we can do it. In terms of black studies and Chicano studies, one of the things that I think is really important is that we look at the history of the Latino and the history of the African American and see the joint history. Yes. Yeah. Because if we don't start teaching the joint history, uh, for example, the president of Mexico had a huge conference uh, talking about the third route. And, so, and it's on the African, Native, and European experience. And even when Latinos only want to identify with, the, with Spain, well, Africans ruled that for, for, for almost 800 years. So you can't get away from that third route or that mutual connection. What it did for my students and my classes is it helped them see themselves in one another. What it does when you take that conversation to the community, it helps people see themselves in one another. That's right. And I think if David Alvarez had done that, he would have won. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so a couple of things. Um, this is where academic leadership comes into play, deans and your VPs of, of, of academic instruction. One of the problems that departments do is, especially large departments, they tend to bully smaller departments, yeah. sociology, poli sci, history. Yeah. This is where you say, no turf wars, because we all win in diversity in the curriculum. Yes. So that's one of the key issues that I see at the CCs and the community colleges, is that when we try to have these discussions, certain departments are like, well, that idea is mine. And that's ridiculous. Ideas don't belong to people, nor do they belong to departments or department chairs. Um, so this is where we need deans and VPs to say, let's do something different. Knowledge cannot just be contained in your large department because you're looking to fill up your full-time equivalent student enrollment in your seats, <laughs> right? We have to go beyond thinking of that way, and we really have to be collaborative and really get people to think differently about how people need this knowledge. One of the things that we do in ethnic studies is that I tell students that this conflict over the sociology of race, et cetera, et cetera, is that we study sociology and ethnic studies because it's about how we have been constructed in the past. We see the ways in which deficiency theories keep on our recycling over and over again. Oh, Latinos and African Americans, it's their culture, their biology, their families, their moms, their dads, whatever. Right? So this is where we start to say, this is why we, we study sociology. So the student needs to get both perspectives. They need to see what the dominant says about us, but we also need to know what is the challenges to that. Uh, in terms of this point about the dialogue between black and brown, that's critical. The first free black people in the Americas were in Mexico. Yanga took up his machete and he gained his liberty and freedom. So the first black free space was in southern Mexico. 
So we have to keep a reminding folks, and again, I don't know what the dynamic is here in San Diego, but in LA and in Orange County, we have a new group of people called Blacksicans. <laughs> and the production of uh, black, black and Latino couples having children. Right, we tend to focus on white, Latino, white, black. But now we're seeing in places like the Inland Empire, this is a growing population. So these folks are joined in love, literally, the product of love. So we have to start really thinking differently about these conversations. Yeah. Um. I'm sorry, I just wanted to add one thing. You know, we currently on our campus created, uh, we're working to create a women's studies um, degree. And we created, uh, there is a women's studies committee that actually put together some courses. And from its, its creation, this program actually utilized existing courses. So we have, a, in Chicano studies we have, um, gender and, and sexuality in, in the in Latino communities, that's a class, that's part of the, the major that's going to be um, created. They also took our um, Chicanas, Latinas, and Contemporary Society class, that's part of the major. So these conversations are taking place. Fortunately for us, the creation of this new program is from its inception a collaborative. And, and we find that. The other thing I was going to mention is we have allies on our campus, for example, child development and education on our campus sends us their students. They have faculty there who say, you're going to be working with Latino, you're going to be working with African American children as an educator in LA County. So you have to take African American studies, you have to take it. And they encourage it, they built it into their curriculum for their degree, that they must take classes in ours, because it's not just learning about those groups, but it's that perspective. And so I'm really appreciative that those collaborations do exist. There's a few others on our campus that send us their students. And they, I, I mean, I, I congratulate them. They are working to diversify their, their faculty, but at the same time, they know that what we're offering isn't just that, 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 that content, but it's really that perspective that we're developing. Just real quickly, I'll just add the power of students and classes. Many times sociology students, political science students, ethnic studies students are the same students. And so uh, to the extent that I was a poli science sociology student and I had taken black studies and uh, Chicano studies classes and I went back to those departments and said, give me credit in these departments for those coursework because they are in fact the same uh, uh, liberal arts that will in fact enhance my ability to be uh, effective in my other classwork. So, so there's power for students as well, to the extent that you can find allies within the, um, the deans and the administrators and actually put that out as that's how you can support me to be successful at the university, is to break away some of this um, territorialness that happens between some of the little arts. So. Hi, how you doing? My name is Derek Isaac and I'm an alumni of Mesa College for Black Studies. Uh, my question is, I know everybody has to stay in their lane, but how are we going to the grassroots level of high school, middle school, plugging what we have into them and allowing them to flourish to get to the community college level? Thank you. I actually taught um, black studies at Lincoln High School. Um, and I also had a daughter at Lincoln High School who was doing uh, workshops and lectures for the students. And then they took it out yeah. because of budget cuts. Yeah. After they took it out, they had race riots, they had all kind of craziness going on. Look, our children have got to know who they are. And if you don't, I don't care what neighborhood, what economic level, what GPA, you're still going to have drug addicts. You're still going to have kids using sex to sedate themselves. You're still going to have all the social issues we see with our young people because they don't have a sense of themselves. And so K through 12, it is essential that we start teaching children their history and their culture and their connection to people in the world. When Dr. Weber talked about kindergarten all day, part of me got excited and another part cringed. <laughs> If, you, if your child is in school for six hours and you, they come home and you say, what did you learn and they say nothing, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> but when you incorporate knowledge of self, when children come home, you won't ask them what they learn. They'll be telling you. That's right. And that becomes the challenge. 
They say that children don't have a long attention span. Teach them about themselves and see how much longer it becomes. That's right. Um, I'm just going to add to that. I think that that's one of the things that we find. One of the, the things that we've been doing for a long time, and you're right about budget, is that we've offered classes in the community. So as I briefly mentioned before, we offer Chicano Studies classes at the East Los Angeles Women's Center. We offer classes at the Belvedere um, uh, Boys and Girls Club. We teach, cl and they're classes for credit. Um, we teach classes at our local high schools. Um, we teach classes at Homeboy Industries, which is a works a jobs program that, oh, yeah. that helps you know uh, former gang members to be able to you know find productive work and lead productive lives. And so one of the things that I think is, is very important that about that is that it's you have to make a concerted effort to really maintain those ties, um, and also to be sure that when you send we as a department when we send faculty out to teach those classes that. They tell us, those, those managers at those different institutions tell us, we don't want dumbed down classes. We want exactly what you teach your students on your campus. That's what we want you to offer us. Because yes, some of these, these people are high school students. Some of them are dropouts. But you know what? What we're offering, they rise to the challenge. When we dumb down our expectations, yeah, they become bored. And so one of the things that, that we really are emphasizing right now, and this is a discussion we're having, is that we want to make sure that it's, it's that we send our, our most qualified faculty to teach those classes, because they are important. Because that's what gives students, I, I've been very um, impressed when I get a student, it's fall semester, it's their first time on campus, and I, you know, I always ask students, how many of you have ever taken an ethnic studies class before? And when I get those students who say, I took one in high school, oh, I took one when I was in eighth grade. I, it's, and they're like, that's why I'm back. Because it's exactly that experience. I want to major in this. But we need to increase our presence there. Hopefully now that we're formalizing a lot of this, because we're getting monies to do it, um, to really kind of make it a lot more seamless and not just hodgepodge. Our campus does it, but you know, some of our sister campuses in our district don't offer any classes in the community. So that's something that we're, we're struggling with. Institutionally, this is where we talk about academic leadership again, your deans, your VPs, your presidents need to create an office called the Community Partners Office. Cal State yes. Fullerton has a Community Partners Office. We have the internships run out of it. They do all the legalese and all the risk management stuff so that we don't have to worry about that so we can just go straight into a community. So that with this Educational Partnerships Office has helped us connect with already existing programs such as Upward Bound, Gear Up, Talent Search, these already federal trio programs and we partner with them. This last summer, uh, this office created a uh, Gear Up University where they brought kids from Anaheim Unified Schools for two weeks on our campus and we gave them ethnic studies courses and as well as regular courses for two weeks. And what we did was we empowered the students. These are high school students, right? Gear Up does the whole grade level. The F students through the 4.799, right? The whatever, the loaded GPA. Um, and we worked with them for two weeks at the end of that program, the superintendent of Anaheim School said, well, let me talk to a sampling of the students. He picked out 10, thought, I think he was going to pat them on the head. And instead, the students demanded, why don't we have office hours with our teachers? Where's the syllabi so I can know how to prepare for the rest of the semester? Right? Why, why can't I email my teachers questions about my assignments? The students, it was like pouring gasoline. <laughs> on people who wanted to learn. And the superintendent just kind of rolled back saying, whoa. So one of the high schools is piloting office hours for its teachers. It's piloting syllabi in the classroom. So they will have college-ready skills. So when they come to us, they will know. Because many times we get first-generation students, and they're like, what's the homework? And it's like, it's in the syllabus, right? Um, now we give them the skills in high school. Right? And this is why that college, K through 12, right? In college, we love to complain about the high school teachers don't prepare the students. Well, let's do something about it, right? So we began to partner with the teachers. So part of this two-week program, my TAs were the high school teachers. And they learned content, and they were able to update their content, and that's so critical. So instead of sitting complaining in our office about they're not doing their job, well, let's do something about it, right? Working with those teachers. The teachers don't want pedagogy. They're tired of their credential courses. They want content and they want to speak to ethnic studies faculty. Another question. 
side, and then we'll move to this side. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, thank you, panel, for being here. Uh, my name is Michael Hill. I'm currently a student at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, I'm a former student of uh, Mesa College. I took my ASL 1 class here. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in Miami. I grew up in uh, Miami, Florida. And in Florida, growing up, black history meant something to us. It was very important from elementary school to middle school to high school. It was, a, Black History Month was huge. There was a lot of events that um, we entertained uh, in Florida, coming in California through the, through the Marine Corps. It seemed to be a little more diluted here in California. Um, <laughs> What can we do as a community to ensure that our young people are more culturally empowered to know where they come from, who they are, and where we should be encouraging them to head for themselves? All right. Um, I, I, I've heard this. I, we hired a new faculty person in African American studies who is from Florida. And one of the things she said about California culture as opposed to Southern culture is that we're more segregated here, which I find that very interesting that a Southerner, yeah. African American, <laughs> says here in Southern California and California we are more segregated. So I think that's very telling. Um, it really is creating those black spaces and brown spaces and demanding that those spaces exist. One of the things that uh, I did back at Cal State Fullerton this last year was we had a very thin, very anemic Black History Month, and I said, we cannot do that. With actually, before we do all the celebration, I said, we need to talk about the Middle Passage. Because before we talk about Black History, this is why we have Black History. And we kicked it off, and we, and we honored and commemorated those who died in the Middle Passage, as well as those who continue to die because of institutional racism, Trayvon Martin, uh, Oscar Grant. We called out all those names. So we started with that first. And it really changed the dynamic in terms of people like, wow, this is very different. Go, yeah, it is different when we start talking about these things. Ethnic studies, the other value that we haven't talked about is the fact that we are willing, and I'm sure many of us here on the panel have done it, we talk to parents. And so having parents and the faculty work together, we think that's a K-12 strategy, but it's like, no. If I'm going to succeed and I have somebody's child in my classroom, I need to make sure that the parent is on my team as well. And that's how we start creating these changes and really start saying, why don't we have a black history program? One speaker is not enough, right? One program is not enough. And this is where we start making those demands. This is, again, academic leadership. The VPs, the deans need to talk to these students and say, are we doing enough for black history month? Right? That's a question. Are we supporting black graduation? Are we doing the things, black kickoff, when the fall starts? We need to start doing this and bringing the parents in. We need to bring our parents or people who are our families onto campus so they can see what this is about because the best advocate for higher education, the best advocate to keep our kids through are people who can start talking to those nine-year-olds in their family and say, guess what you're going to next over here. That's what needs to happen. That's why parents have to be included. I'm retired. December 30th. <laughs> No, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And immediately I'm repurposed. And one of the first things that came to me to do was to curate an exhibit at the Women's Museum of California, the only women's museum in California. And what I was asked to do is a, uh, an exhibit on black women. And the exhibit is entitled Beautiful, Brilliant, and Brave, a yeah. Celebration of Black Women. They asked me to do it for Black History Month and Women's History Month. That's major. Because rarely in Women's History Month do we hear about women of color. Mm -hmm. The exhibit, the first night at the opening, we were hoping for 60 people. We had 110. The second night, we were hoping for 150. We had over 300. Why am I sharing this with you? Because we want to know about each other, but we want to know about ourselves. And we want to be able to see our connections with one another. This exhibit has two faculty from Mesa College. Well, Judy Sendai, would you please stand because I want to acknowledge you. That's right. We started the Rites of Passage uh, program for African American girls here in San Diego and brought some amazing people together. Our chancellor, who was also the president of Mesa College, is being honored, Constance Carroll. 
and then a lot of other local women. One of the things we tend to do is we keep looking for expertise outside of our area. We pay all these speakers big bucks to come in and speak for an hour. You have genius That's right. in this community. Say it one more time. And I know they always say you can't be a prophet in your own home. That's right. But, but the reality is we better start with identifying some of these prophets. That's right. Because they will save our communities and they will save our children. We also need to understand that only 18 to 20 percent of Africans taken out of Africa ended up in the United States. The majority of Africans outside of Africa, habla espanol, are Portuguese. And if we don't start connecting globally with that consciousness and understand that every time I see a black face throughout the diaspora, I'm seeing a connection. My Afro-European brothers, my Afro-Asian brothers, my Afro-Latino brothers, just, we need to begin to acknowledge that. We also need to understand we have different um, focuses. As, as people of color. We have been defined in myths, lies, and stereotypes. And so our academia has to be responsible for breaking those myths, those lies, and those stereotypes. I don't want to see another documentary on welfare mothers showing me black women. When women with children of every ethnicity and predominantly European American are the people on welfare. And that welfare isn't, isn't something that to be ashamed of. It wouldn't exist if we had employment. And so focus on the, the, the solutions yes. as opposed to the issues connected to those right. solutions. And so we have to begin to start getting a different perspective. And then just a black face, a Latino face, an Asian face does not qualify you to teach black studies. Asian yeah. studies, Latino studies. Look, if I'm miseducated as a black PhD, I'm going to walk into a classroom and miseducate a whole room full of people. My, mo my mother used to say there's no fool like an educated fool. They're dangerous. And so part of our challenge is the perspective and connecting the head, the heart, and the culture. Because I can be black and, and never been around a black person before. You see, so we have to begin to look broader and we de define deeper so that we can be more inclusive and so that students leave with what they came in with, a brilliant mind that is seeking the truth. Hello. Um, I wanted to say thank you for having this event open for us uh, and for sharing everything, you know, and everything between black and Latino and diversity. I'm a white woman, as you can see, but when I came in here for counseling and they recommended that I take one humanities class, and I thought, hmm, I guess I'll take a black studies class. Once I got into this class, I do not regret taking that class at all. I learned so much, and I gave myself more respect. I give my I give respect to that culture, uh, the knowledge, the awareness of the background. I never had that in my any part of my education growing up. Why didn't I learn any of this? I wish now I look to future children. And I don't think they're going to have that education about different cultures. So I understand some of your words that parents should teach their children. You're correct. Babies come from parents. And the parents are the first teachers that they have. Their mothers, their fathers. They are the rock for their children. Both my children have half Latino and half white in them, they're going to learn their culture. I'm just saying in th this class, this university, it really has impressed me very much, this community college. I respect them so much more. I appreciate everything you do. Oh, one more question, okay. I was wondering, 
You know, you told a story before about the guy that was helping you walk down the stairs, and when you asked him if he was taking your class, and he said, why would I take your class? I'm from Washington, D.C. That's something that I've encountered with a lot of black people. Obviously, I'm black. A lot of times, people will ask me, like, what do you check in the box? Do you check African-American? And I don't really like being called African-American because I don't really know what that means for me. It's kind of a disconnect. Because when people say, like, oh, I'm, I'm Irish, or I'm Scottish, or I'm, I'm Spanish, they know where they're coming from. But I find it kind of disrespectful just to say that I'm African. Because Africa isn't a country. It's a continent with a lot of different countries. Yeah. So I'm wondering, how do we, we bridge that gap for individuals? Because you're talking about we need to find a way for people to, to know who they are. But how do we do that? Because there's still going to be something that's lost within them. We can have an entire class filled with African-American individuals and tell them all the great things that Africans have done, but they still don't know who they are. Because there's at some point during that middle passage that it was all lost. All those papers were lost. So they have no way to say if they were part of this person's ancestry or another person's ancestry. So they're never going to know. So when they got to Massachusetts or they got to Florida or they got to wherever they were, they lost all that. They lost that legacy. So there's something that we as black Americans don't have. What does it mean to be black? And so, so I'm just wondering, how do we do that? Okay. Oh, I'm so glad you asked yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it was African when my grandmother wrapped her head the way she wrapped her head, but it was African. I didn't know it was African when my aunt healed us with the laying on of hands, but it was African. I didn't know it was African when the minister called and the congregation responded and the sister got the spirit of the Holy Ghost, but it was African. That's we didn't right. lose a thing. Exactly. What we lost was the acknowledgement of what we did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's in our DNA. My mother cornrowed my sister's hair. I would ask her what she learned. She said, I just knew. In other words, look, we're taught that you have to experience things to become those things. You are born those things. And we are in Africa. The thing I love about studying Africa, I was going to do a class called Africa's Contributions to the World, and then I discovered the world was African. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? We're all connected. We're all an African people. People say, I'm Mexican and black. No, you're Mexican and African. I'm, Me I'm, I'm um, white and, and black. No. Guess what? Black and white are not a space a time, a history, a culture. They're a sociological construct. Mm -hmm. And you can acknowledge it from the sociological constructual space, but it has no meaning other than we divided people into categories and gave them these labels. Yeah. Black people were called black people only because of the color, mm -hmm. initially. And mm -hmm. white people weren't even called white people mm -hmm. until <laughs> white people created racism. Do you understand how deep that is? And because we don't study racism, and we don't understand where it comes from, and that it didn't always exist, which the good news is means it doesn't always have to exist, because it's simply a thought form. And for black people in our um, slave genes is a piece of self-rejection, uh, because we were so brutalized under slavery. The history has still never been told. If you saw 12 years of slave, multiply that by 400 years. You understand what I'm saying? And so we begin, to, what, what our children suffer from is not having a name. You meet a, a Latino, they say I'm Mexican, I'm Cuban, I'm something. Yes. And they don't argue about it with each other. You, right. The young African-American male asked Minister Farrakhan after that last shooting of the young man in Florida. Minister Farrakhan, where do black people come from? Our children are the only children in our homes with our mothers and fathers. We're not taught where we come from. And if we don't know where we came from, how are we going to find where we need to go? And so, yeah, it, it can be, I mean, I thought I was African by a white woman when I was nine. But I embraced it immediately because it made sense. My DNA recognized the truth in it. Now look, Africa is a Greek word. So I don't want you to get hung up on the word. I want you to get hung up on the concept that human beings have origin. And in this lifetime, we call it Africa. 
<clears throat> in this period that we're living in. I have African American students raised in predominant white communities north of eight who weren't able to sit in a black studies class because they couldn't get comfortable with black people, which means they weren't comfortable with themselves. Yeah. Do you understand? Well, I can't see myself in you. I, I just did a, a workshop at the museum called A Womanhood, What It Means to Be a Woman. And I have women who say, you know, I have no women friends. I want to weep for them. How do you make it? <laughs> because you are a woman. That means you've got a self-issue if you have no friends who are of your own gender. You have a self-issue if you have no friends who are of your own ethnicity. Because we're all mirrors. Are you, are you following me? The beautiful thing that happened in the workshop, because I want you to understand it's not just uh, us needing to know us, we need to know each other. A Latino man came up to me after the workshop and he said to me, I just want to thank you because I'm about to become the father of a daughter. And I've learned so much about women tonight, we're talking two hours, that I know that I'm going to be a better father to my daughter. You learn about yourself so you can be a better human being in the world. <clears throat> You are not in awe of anyone because you don't measure yourself next to anyone. You recognize you are enough. And that makes you free to go anywhere, be anywhere, do anything, knowing that you will succeed because you're not programmed to say, well, you know, that's what white folks do, or that's what Mexicans do, or that's what, are you following? Because you see your humanity starting with your beginning, but that's your beginning is not your end. I would be foolish to stand here and tell you I, I thought there wasn't a European in me. I'd be <coughs> foolish to stand here and tell you I thought there wasn't a Native American in me. We are all the human families been traveling and mixing for thousands upon thousands of years. There was a time there were no Net Mexicans. Are you following me? My daughter teaches Africa's legacy in Mexico. She says, what were Mexicans doing before Columbus came? And the answer is, there were none. Do you get that? What were Negroes doing? We weren't Negroes. And our history does not start at our lowest point. Our history starts at the cradle of civilization. Math, science, technology, languages, social organization, government, democracy. Hello. And when our children get that, then they also know that they don't have a highest point because the zenith is possible. Are you following me? So thank you for asking that question. <laughs> And with that, we are going to come to a conclusion. I just want to say thank you very much for everyone stuck it out. We are here for three hours. It was wonderful. But I, I was inspired um, on behalf of Chicano Studies. Um, I just want to thank you and welcome you. Uh, this is your first time at Mesa. Welcome. If not, please come back. And also, let's give a big uh, round of applause.